Uh, welcome everybody to Chess Dojo's coverage of round six of the Candidates Tournament. And um, I was realizing today, Kosia, that we're getting pretty close to the halfway point in this tournament. Yeah, Candidates. Um, next round tomorrow will be round seven, and yeah. that'll, be, that'll be halfway. And then there's going to be the rest day on Friday, right? So when the rest day happens, they'll be exactly halfway into their tournament. Everyone will have played everybody once. Yeah, first half done, first round robin done, then second round robin with reverse colors. Yeah, then we get the reverse Boss couples. Tweed. Hello, hello. Start getting some rematches. Uh, but for now, there are a couple people who haven't played each other. Uh, Sorry, that's me. I've got YouTube on. That's fine. Um, for now, there's still a few people who haven't played each other. And um, folks will see that I saw this epic game from last night up. I've been replaying yesterday's games uh, today on and off the board in my head all day. Um, but there are two huge matchups of players who have not yet faced each other um, in, this, uh, in this tournament. And one is Nepo versus Fabi. Oh, yeah. Oh, and they're already kicking off the moves. That came in a minute faster than I thought. Um, all right, we got Cry here. We're going to bring him in. We're going to bring him in. Um, and then we'll tell you what the other matchups are as you get to see this starting here. All right. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. We're off. Ooh, hyper accelerated dragon from Naka. I have to turn off the little thing that shows the eval bar like immediately, man. <laughs> it's like you gotta you gotta get in there and turn it off. Yeah. And there's also one nice thing we'd like you to turn on, and that is your camera. Oh, I know why that happened. It's because I was streaming earlier. Yep. So start Nepo playing the four knights. Oh man, Jesse, let him have it. Let him have it. <laughs> this one, so okay. My understanding of this is this has been played a gazillion times before. Like Magnus has tried playing this, and it's meant to be just dead. An interesting position, you know. Interesting position. Why? What, how should I let him have it? Why should I let him have it? Well, I mean, if I understand correctly, he's being a weenie. He's half a point up against Fabi and just like safety first. Like <laughs> just don't lose no matter what. Maybe a little bit, but I'm gonna guess that he has some idea. Okay. I'm gonna guess he has an idea. All right. Sorry, it took me a second, folks, to uh <laughs> realign the cameras, but I rejoin you all now. So we've got an opening from Jan. Kosi wonders if it's a weenie opening. And, uh, and Jesse says he's got some kind of an idea. Honestly, you know, our boy is spicing it up pretty quick here with Bishop G4, Bows. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not playing. I'm sure this is all theory, but still. Bishop G4 has been, yeah, well known for a couple of years. <laughs> Line is F3, Bishop H5, DC, Queen D4 check, King H1, Bishop takes C3, BC, Queen C3, and like... Black is okay somewhere. Yep. This is the, I, I don't I, I don't think this is going to be some um, snooze fest here. You know. I I hope not. I hope not. Yeah, yeah. Definitely but not. let's just say that it could be in dudes. Is is it? Let, let's actually pose it as a question. Is it in dudes' self interest to make an easy draw here? I would say no. It's he would like to try to win this game. Jan? Yeah. That is not how he won the candidates last time, though, is it? Well, he has white, though. Right. But I, the, 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 I feel like the way he won the candidates last time was by mm. holding okay. against Fabi mm -hmm. and uh, taking advantage of the less experienced player's uh, mistakes, which is already working but, pretty well this year as well. If you recall, they had an amazing game last time. Where Fabi was black and Fabi played like some whack prep and it was hot. And I thought Fabi definitely came out of that game with the advantage. Um, 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Vienna Circles asking us: Is the four knight scotch a let's just get an interesting position and get a game opening, or a let's draw opening? Like, is it I played to just sort of get a middle game you can play, or is it played to keep things sort of simple so that you know you're you're within comfort comfortable distance of a draw at all times? You can always I mean, see the shore. This thing is all. Look at how complicated it is already. Oh my god. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, to answer the question, it's usually a let's draw position. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Opposite that doesn't answers. Mean, that doesn't mean that you can't play it uh, aggressively for white. Some players have. I remember Kramnik, I think he was trying to actually prove some some edge here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not saying I'm not saying Nepo is 100% playing for a draw, but generally that's the reputation of this opening. It's the bane of every E4, E5 player's existence because it's very, very difficult to... Uh, play for a win is black in this line mm -hmm. and that's kind of what white takes advantage of and what we've yeah. decided is that we're allowing ourselves to look at the um what do we want to call it the the database. opening database yeah so i'm gonna I'll, I'll be in charge of that i guess you know guys uh, of the three of us and this may be surprising given uh what uh what costia has to say about this line but of the three of us, I might be the one to have most recently played this from the white side. <laughs> That's right. You had that game against that uh, German GM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody advised me, instead of playing the King's Gambit, to play this weenie thing. And I played it. Mm -hmm. And the game was, was an instantly dead draw. It really Man, sucked. Easy draw. The higher rate of player. It's it a was choice. a very easy draw. <laughs> against a high rate of player that's true from that perspective um and that was the day i was sick so i didn't i didn't i didn't complain about it too much but if i had been feeling good i would have thought that was kind of a waste of a day okay guys i want to give a little bit of a just an update here mm -hmm. so um this actually happened in the candidates tournament this bishop d5 move in 2021 um and i'm just seeing if that's I'm recent up. that must be from the candidates interrupt us the first half oh that's a good memory of that screw dude okay mm -hmm. yeah because that candidates well, tournament finished half. in 2022 right no wasn't that the second half because i think the first one was in 2020. oh which is shocking to think about it but yeah they really tried to run a tournament during like the start of COVID. The start of COVID, right. And then they had to cancel it because all the players like Gristrook and Wang Hao, everyone was complaining. So this position has been reached a bunch and both Bishop C5 and Queen B2 have been played. Mm. I would guess that after Queen B2, night before Queen B4, over 2,600, there would be a draw rate of 100%. Um, okay, we can check that theory. I can't imagine a player over 2,600 losing with white or white. Oh, black. dude, I'm looking at it here. This dude, Paravian, who is like 2,600, yeah, yeah. has I know. won and lost a bunch of games from this position. What? Oh, yeah. my goodness. Mm -hmm. Classical games, Jesse, or uh, Title Tuesday? There's some, let's just see. There's some Title Tuesday, some Rapid. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, even in a Rapid game, I'd be shocked. He, he lost after the oh. trade on B4 with just same colored bishops that are going to get traded on G6. <laughs> We're going to leave this game, folks. Um, um, oh, come on. Let's give it a second, buddy. Yeah, give it a second because we don't want to miss the handshake. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's another very, very important matchup today for the standings that may have more of an effect on the standings than this one. Now, right. now, Bruce has sent me on this whole like quest to find a game where somebody over twenty six hundred lost. Lost in classical. <laughs> Not like they mouse slipped, you know. The problem is actually like chess space has really killed itself. <clears throat> yeah. With title Tuesday. Oh, title Tuesday just ruined it's the just database like, completely. Just ruined it, dude. By by the way, chess space has continued its crime since we talked about it on the podcast. Uh huh. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to do a chess space special on our podcast because they've been blowing it so oh long. danny in the twitch chat makes a good point naka used this line to beat fabi 
in the Grand Swiss. So that was an example of someone like going for this quote unquote drawish line, but actually having very devious intentions. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, but not after knight takes b4, queen b4. Well, I, I, I think it was a different line. I don't remember exactly how that game went, but... My claim uh, is just once that knight and bishop are traded. Yeah, okay, it definitely so, wasn't this position with knight b4, queen b4. Yeah. The topical move here is rook b1, but also king h1 has been played. Exciting stuff. So another matchup that we have not yet seen in this <laughs> candidates that may, be, may have an effect on the final standings... Mm -hmm. Not just the final, every game has an effect on the final standings. I mean, it may have an effect on who wins this candidates tournament, right? Gukesh and Naka. Yeah, Gukesh Naka is a huge game. And Naka has gone for um, hyper. Pretty interesting line. I actually had this uh, recently myself as black. Did you play this line with Tatev? Yeah, exactly. I lost that game. That was a tough G5, game. Bishop G4. It was like a fantastically interesting game from the perspective of it was hard to you know who was right or wrong early on when you started fighting with each other yeah, yeah, yeah. um bishop b5 check okay kostia you're going to be our our expert on what's happening so far knight c6 and just takes right away what do you say so far so knight c6 bishop takes c6 <clears throat> that's an interesting move because black was ready to go rook c8 next move mm-hmm and um, yeah, so this is definitely a way to play for an advantage with white. Um, one, I guess, nuance is that as soon as white touches the d-pawn with d3 or d4, black should immediately trade on f3 and do the same thing as to not to allow white to play knight bd2 and reinforce the... Because the bishop on g4 is coming off. It's just such a bad piece here for black that you're never going to like retreat it back in there and be like ha 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 lording it over you with the bishop pair yeah because this is i guess white is taking like a nimzo witchian approach mm -hmm. um we're playing against the doubled c pawns and yeah generally like the bishop pair has a hard time defending these static weaknesses mm-hmm no, it looks fine to me for black. What would white's next move be? Gukesh is thinking about it. Um, here, white can castle, white can go d3, d4. Or queen a4, um, as suggested in chat. All these are moves. Looks like it couldn't be bad. Queen a4, queen d7. I don't really know what you're doing. Yeah, okay. It could be bad. It could be bad. Uh, Sam, uh, Jesse says, if we go queen d7, defending the pawn... And we're threatening to mess up white's pawn structure. It's not really clear what white does next about the knight. So. Yeah. Yeah, strategically very, very rich position. Yeah. Um, I'm also super interested in the Vidit game. Okay. Vidit Perugia. I have that one up too. As... Oh, old classical line. Holy this moly. Is, this is a line from my own book. Nice. And uh, wait, Farouja played queen d8? Yeah, I'm going to back up like two or three Hold moves on. for folks. So I'll show them this position here. This is called the classical Sicilian here with knight f6 and knight c6, right, Kostya? Yes. Yeah. So at this point, classical Sicilian, one famous line here is bishop g5, which is called the Richter Rouser attack. But basically, bishop g5 is looking at castling queenside, and it's one of the more aggressive lines for white against this setup um and bishop c4 played by vidit i think it's considerably less popular it also has yes. aggressive intentions right like white's thinking maybe velomirovich kind of attack like bishop e3 queen e2 castles queenside mm -hmm. and normally black plays the move queen b6 which prevents that by hitting d4 early on well, isn't this like the whole problem with Fisher's setup here with because queen b6 and then it was discovered like, oh, my knight has to go back to b3 and that's lame because then my bishop on c4 can't go there. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a tangle. It's a tangle mm -hmm. there. I spent my youth, among other things, playing the move bishop e3 in this position and saying there's no way you can just move your queen around again and again like to b2. I play knight b5. There's no way you can get away with this black. 
Uh-huh. And they got away with it every time. <laughs> um, and I lost like, I don't know, three or four games in tournaments, plus, you know, dozens of practice games um, playing Bishop E3 in this position. Just obstinately. I'm bringing out my pieces. You're moving your queen around. Die. Uh, you guys, I want to share a little story that I got from um, you know, these great interviews that happened afterwards. This was with Naka's okay. interview about his game with Ferrucci yesterday. And, you know, me and David were, uh, Kosti left and me and David were doing it. And, you know, definitely like Bruges had a great game, collapsed, probably should be ending in a draw. But then there's this moment where Nakaru makes what looked to me and David a little like a frisky move. Um, and it, for Not a second form. there, it looked like Ferruja had something. And me and David were like, oh, maybe he's got something. And Naka was like describing the situation is really interesting. He was like, yeah, it's well known that he's nervous. He started shaking and I noticed he was shaking, you know, and then I noticed he was about ready to go for it. He thought he was better and Naka didn't feel he was better. And there was this really interesting psychological thing where then he collapses in the last 10 minutes of the game. And for Naka and apparently for other people at the top, this was like totally symptomatic of what's going wrong with Farouz's chess. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't really appreciated that when I picked him for number two in this tournament, you know? And right, that's how you're going to get slain. You're going to get slain in a tournament like this, you know? And people know that. And then they're like, he, and so Naka gambles. There's this position where Naka gambles instead of playing knight, BD, knight B2, I think he plays knight F4. Mm-hmm. And it's like, who knows what could be happening? And Naka gambles it with Knight, knight F4 and um, and Ferruja collapses. It's like, oh, wow. Also interesting, the gamble. Because, you know, Naka is a gambling dude. Mm-hmm. He's a gambling dude, man. Yeah. Anyways, I just thought that was a fascinating insight. Also, because me and David, we shared the same feeling that Ferruja had as in, oh, maybe I'm going to get something here. You know, mm-hmm. maybe I got a little something, something. Yeah. No, that was that was fascinating. I saw Naka's recap and he was talking about it. And yeah, I felt like he he read Feruja like a book, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it was the right. same thing. I think uh, Giri made this point on Twitter. It was like the same as the critical Rook G6 moment from the last World Championship match where Nepo thought the game was over. They're repeating. Then Ding mm-hmm. avoids the repetition with this weird move Rook to G6. All of a sudden you're still in the game. The game isn't ending. Mm-hmm. And like you com- lost like your entire competitive focus at that point and uh, no that was a fascinating moment the way naka turned that around and i think it's great for the tournament too um because naka i think really needed that win to to remember what it's like to win in game and now now he's like now he remembers like oh yeah i'm actually a top chess player i'm actually one of the best chess players in the world so this is i think fantastic for the tournament because now there's so many killers nepo fabi naka gukesh Prague. All these guys can just take anyone out at any moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Lots of firepower going on here. So knight b3, e6, bishop f4, queen d8, queen okay, d2. So here, queen d8 is really weird. Like knight e5 is 100% the move there. Okay. But Ferruja okay. is not just, uh, I mean, his time suggests, given that there's no increment, right? And they have to write down the moves and punch the clock and stuff. Yeah. 157 is the no increment version of he's just blitzing this out. Um, not yeah, exactly. So game, Queen right? D8, that would be interesting to check the database, like how many times that's been played. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's not something you just do quickly. Yeah. And a6 to stop knight b5. This um, black playing queen b6, queen d8 also doesn't feel quite right, does it? I mean, well, no, I guess it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, apparently Gelfand played this weird queen d8 move once. It's definitely a weird looking move. Yeah. But I mean, you've made white retreat the knight. If you get in b5 while the knight's on b3, their bishop has to go to e2, so they've wasted time there. If they play knight back to d4 to be able to play bishop b3, then they move back and forth while you move back and forth. So it's not it's not like at the ideal level you can just say black's dumb here. 
Yeah, for sure. I could see Alareza winning this game, though, because it's going to be a uh, super sharp Sicilian. And okay, to me, Vida, he's always going to be more of a D4 player. So I can see this getting really spicy. He's been heavily, heavily investing in E4 for a while now. Um, and uh, I don't think it's hurt him as much as it hurt Kramnik <laughs> way back. <laughs> um, yeah. But, I mean, he's certainly caught out as far as preparation here. And to my mind, open Sicilians are one of the most miserable places to be caught out of prep. As white. Because if you just play randomish, unaggressive moves, I feel like the game drifts mm -hmm. towards black. Yeah. And, I mean, there are a few things more awful than sort of inexorably losing a game as white. So, um, I, I feel like that's one of the places... In my own experience of playing chess tournaments, right? Like, there were many times I was out of book and my opponent wasn't. It happened a lot. And with the Sicilians, that was kind of like one of the most miserable where I just felt like, oh God, you know, now I'm reduced to just playing random stereotype moves that don't have any particular point or bite and the game's just slowly going against me. And David, I'm just going to give you the confirmation that your take on this, <laughs> Jan is just, he's going full Tausch machine over here, dude. Yeah. He's gone full Tausch machine over here. Oh, David's take. Excuse me. It was Kostya's even more than me. But <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I called it immediately when he went for that. He even <laughs> managed to get opposite colored bishops instead of same colored bishops. So now if he could just get queens off the board, like if his next move is queen e5, the game's done, right? Yeah, he might do it. More or less. I mean, with queens on the board... You know, there's some middle game options with the bishops, but in end games, it's pretty dead. Um, so, in chat before, when we talked about this position was equal, we definitely had one or two people who were saying, "Why would it be so drawish? What's the big deal?" You know, we were around, we were around here, you know, talking about you know bishop b4, knight takes b4, whatever. And basically, it's the symmetrical pawn structure is the main reason why we were saying that, folks. And so. It's natural to put your rooks on the heavy file on, on the open files, <clears throat> which can lead to trades of rooks. But also, the variation already has three pairs of minor pieces traded off. So it, at this point here, you know we were talking about knight before, which would have been three pairs off, and also this bishop on h5. It's only going one place, which is g6, and it's only getting traded. So we were thinking three to four pairs of minor pieces traded off the board. Now, in terms of end games in chess. Queen and rook endings, queen endings, comma, and rook endings separately. Those are the two most drawish kind of endgames, pretty much. And bishop versus knight, knight versus bishop, um, you know, knight versus knight, same colored bishop. Those are the ones where there's the most winning chances off of a small advantage. So as we're headed towards, you know, just pieces getting sucked off the board, the rooks are going to head towards b1 and e1 and trade each other. Nobody's got any real weakness. It doesn't mean you can't play anybody out there at whatever level you're at. You can play these positions, but for you know, for strong grandmasters to lose these positions, the drawing margin is really wide. Like they have to have something pretty bad happen to them. Um, if they Ooh, have a small disadvantage, to, um, they know how to draw from a bad position. Can we go to Naka's game. Yeah. Castles. Yeah, yeah, queen e5 from Nepo. It's, queen it's e5 it's from over. Nepo, dude. <laughs> the gold house machine. Now, wait, before we talk about Naga, I just want to say quickly, how you know, if the guy's winning tournaments three times in a row with this approach, you, you can't call it that dumb. I know Proust doesn't like it, but, you know, how dumb oh, can yeah. it be if you're, no, drawing, I mean, uh, if you're, you know, getting there? If you're achieving from Nepo's goal, point of view, I, I think it makes perfect sense. You, not, you reduce the risk. It's not dumb, and, right? It's uh, just... Uh, it's just, you could say cynical or terroristic, right? Like Grishuk's candidates run, you know? It is cynical, yeah. And it's also, it is tempting, it is tempting fate. Because the chess goddess Kaisa famously doesn't like this kind of behavior. And people might not believe in it, but 
people do get punished for doing this kind of thing. Really? I thought they always get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially this early in the tournament, I if I was his coach, I'd be like, boss, you have white. We know that Fabi's prep, but you are too. So you're going to have to at least roll the dice a little bit. No, no, know? no. He thinks he can full Tausch machine against Fabi and maybe one or two other favorites. Mm -hmm. Petrov everybody. You know? Yeah. Like even if your name's Abasov or whatever, he'll just Petrov you. <laughs> Petrov everybody, provoke somebody, win one or two points here or there because he's, he's figured out that he's got the better nerves, that the other people, you know, mm -hmm. they haven't been mm -hmm. there. They don't have what it takes to hold it together. You know, he just pounce on one or two mistakes. He knows there's some young people. Maybe he maybe he knows how to read, you know, Faruja or somebody else, like like what Naka was talking about. You know, maybe he's got his victims selected. And he knows he only needs a certain number of points, right? And then you just, the draws start piling in inexorably and multiple people are chasing you. And they're trying to get wins more and more desperately and like against each other. And they're starting to play worse. And I mean, he's he's got some kind of full concept. I don't think we could give him better advice on tournament strategy that much i don't think we could do boss is it because you've been in france so long that you're saying inexorably instead of inexorably i've always said that <laughs> is that a france thing dude no i mean it's just a, a me thing some a lot of my words i learned from books so i don't necessarily know how to say them okay yeah jesse you're making fun of a reader <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder. Sometimes you, I, I lived in Europe for a long time too, and I, I came back and I said some funny things, dude. I was yeah. saying some funny things. So, so Sam asked, what? How many points does he need to win the tournament? Right. I mean, last time he won the tournament with plus five, right? But uh, plus four would definitely be enough to win the tournament, we think, and plus three could do it. So, you know, he's already at plus two and he's probably got a plan to get to about plus three or but so. But it, it's, and it's see way too needs. early to uh, to tell that. I mean, I, I don't think this is, I don't think he has some number of points in mind. No, no, this is just, Bobby's the number one seed. I don't want to take risk against him. Let me draw this game. I don't think it really extends too far beyond that. Yeah, and actually, here's an interesting thing. Uh, so Chess Numbers did this, um, you know, question like what happens if who wins you know so if either one of them wins their chances of winning the tournament go up above 50 percent and then with a draw they're both kind of settling around 30 percent fabi's a little higher so if Fa but fabi's a, a half point behind you're saying if fabi wins this game his chances of winning the candidates go over 50 percent yeah 53 percent because he's the favorite halfway now, one of the into the that, tournament halfway yeah. into the tournament and he'd only be maybe tied with gukesh but remember, so what chess numbers does is yeah. what he's saying is like, and I, I believe this is when you're rated higher, your chances of winning every single game are just higher, you know? Mm -hmm. So interestingly, actually, in terms of the model, mm -hmm. the model gives, if anybody's going to win this game, it says Fabi's going to win, has a slight chance of winning this game, you know, just because Fabi's higher rated. So, but, but one of the things that he, he said that I take like black into account, it does, but I'm just saying that's how much it's favoring Fabi. But wow. one of the things that he said that I thought was interesting is like his model is basically an ELO model rating model, mm -hmm. but the problem is dude, Jan's performance rating at this tournament has always been so high right. that it's like, if there's maybe we need to somehow take that into account in the model, yeah. you know? No, I mean, if you were trying to do a more specific, uh, <clears throat> if you were trying to do a more specific prediction for a tournament, then you would take into account factors like how is somebody done in, in tournaments like this or this exact tournament, etc. You know. Yeah, for sure. Okay. The other thing is that Fabi had won this game. I mean, he'd be winning with black, and then he gets white and Nepo in the in the second half. So, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a pretty big deal. The thing is, Sihan, I, right now Gukesh is ahead of Fabi. So even if Fabi won this game, I'm saying they'd only be tied if if Gukesh drew today, for example. So, but yeah, I mean the models. I mean he he has to outrun everybody. You know, there's a lot of people near him in scores. But okay, the models heavily favoring Fabi, and just as uh, Jesse says that Nepo has a high performance rating in candidates tournaments, I'm sure Fabi has a decent performance rating in candidates tournaments too. Yeah. 
Like, he won one once, and he was within one game of Karyakin, the time Karyakin qualified, right? Mm-hmm. And the last candidates, he did a little bit badly. He sort of faded. At it was end. right at the end. When he he wasn't had a in line for first. He suddenly yeah. dropped some points. So, Okay, but Kosi wanted to talk about this position with Naka ages ago. Um, to me, I think Naka's got a great uh, – not that I like – I think black is better, but I think it's a great position for him also being ahead on the clock. What are your thoughts, Coach Team? Um, I actually think it's quite a risky line for black strategically. Um, mm-hmm. But clearly Naka is well prepared. And if we go back a couple of moves, the mm-hmm. C4 move, I think that was, that's kind of, at least that was fresh for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he played it in 15 really seconds. And it set idea. Gukesh really thinking. So that's that move is... Maybe the most important move of the game so far. Looks very ambitious yeah. to me as to Murphy. Like you're spending your tempi. Spending your tempi, boss. Yeah, it's very interesting. But he okay guarantees the trade of his C pawn. Because White has to go D3 or B3. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I think the game continued logically. right? It was like D3 or D4, yeah. take, take. Let me just say and that if White, if White three. played B3, though, for argument's sake, Black's structure would still be worse, right? So C4 doesn't necessarily fix the structure. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I had a game to recently me, where I played an early C4 as Black in a Rosalimo and found I was still structurally struggling just off my A7 pawn. So, so in this position, you guys, I feel like Black can play basically for a frisky knight h6 f6 or a dark square weakness with e6 knight e7 mm-hmm. you can throw in queen c7 or whatever you want to but i think you kind of have a choice between those two right um i like this move queen e2 from gukesh yeah he's preparing knight d2 knight f3 if i understand correctly yeah the knight on f3 i feel like stands quite well in this position right He's also maybe asking some questions about e6 or queen a6 or f4, f5. So it's it's a lost tempo, but there's a lot of flexible ideas behind it. As someone who's suffered in the French, I feel like I feel pretty comfortable with this one. I know. You know, we got rid of our dark square, light square bishop. Yeah. We can play e6 whenever we want, boss. That Our center is pretty solid. Yeah. And we do have to worry, like Kostya says, about some kind of play on the king side but it's not it's kind of abstract still at the moment exactly why that should be crushing us playing a lot of frenches has also caused me to overestimate black's position in french structures that are not as bad as the french <laughs> yeah same <laughs> i'm also a french. recovering french addict yeah <sighs> jesse you should go back to the sicilian man you'd have so much fun there what do you think about? I'm loving the French, dude. French is beautiful. Okay. Um, I did play the French, the Sicilian for years. Mm-hmm. We yeah. got a question from Patrick Daly about Bishop G7, saying if Naka's plan in theory is to play Knight H6, why play Bishop G7 first? Doesn't Knight H6, or sorry, yeah, doesn't Bishop G7 expose you to maybe later playing Knight H6 and losing a tempo after Bishop H6, Bishop H6? My guess is um, he if the knight goes to h6, then he probably doesn't care about the tempo um, in right. view of getting the bishop. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But it's not clear to me that black does want to play knight h6. Right. right. Knight h6 uh-huh. is the frisky plan because you have to feel confident that that knight's not going to get sidelined over there. So if, if I play knight h6 and you take, then I just, I just do a dance of joy when you take it because I'm like, oh, God, my one problem in life solved. Mm-hmm. Thank oh, you. Oh, do we have um, Lenderman in the waiting room? Maybe. Oh, Lenderman's good choice. See. Okay. Yes, we do. Let's All go. right. Folks, we're gaining uh, another special guest, Grandmaster Alex Lenderman. And then join us momentarily. Nice. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hi, Alex. Alex. Okay, hey, David's nice gonna to have to see you. fix the um the layout. Alex, how are you doing? We're gonna get you on the stream in a sec. 
I'm doing great. Yeah, thank you. It was great to see all of you. I watched a lot of your, uh, almost all your, um, you know, videos where you discuss like interesting topics. Okay, mm. cool. Our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Appreciate yeah it. like where predictions of the tournament were so far, Costa, your prediction looks good. Ferruja seventh. It's very logical so far. Thank you, Alex. Someone <laughs> with reason. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious, Alex. What what were your picks for the tournament, and and really, have they changed since you know we've seen some games? To, to be honest, I didn't really think too much. I didn't really pick. I was just li letting others do it for me. I was like listening to what others had to say. But, um, well, um, yeah, yeah I, I think, think uh, it's still it's still hard to say, right? Like, uh, but so far, I guess, uh, yeah, Nepo and uh, and Fabi kind of you know, got away with some difficult games yesterday. So I think, uh, I would, I guess I would still say Napo and Fabi are like the favorites. I mean, Hikaru won a big game yesterday. I never really thought Ferruja that much. So I thought Napo, Hikaru or, or Fabi, I thought most likely. Um, but, uh, Gukesh, I still don't really think, but of course you never know. Um, Speaking of Gukesh, Alex, what do you think about this current position here? Uh, would you rather be white or black? And which plan should black now go for? Let me check. Uh, I have it on my phone. One second. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is uh, okay. Let me turn off the engine. So it says uh, black's turn here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me think without the engine first. So maybe. Um, so the first thing that comes to my mind is if I can play f6 and try to uh, ef knight takes f6 castle and try to undermine their center while they're while they're not fully developed. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, another idea would be to think about queen c7 and then maybe then f6. Although queen c7, it's not clear if like including that is in my favor or not. Maybe like bishop f4, right. then I can't really play f6 anymore. Mm -hmm. So queen to seven, I'm not leaning towards. Probably if this was a blitz game, I would probably play f6. Uh, but I did see also the engine was showed quickly e6. So uh, and then maybe 97 c5 could be the plan. So I'm not so sure. I'd probably have be leaning towards f6, but f6 could be a bit double edged, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, see, this is where the engine corrupts. That's why we don't do it here, Alex. It corrupts you. Um, <laughs> Now, let me yeah, ask your you thoughts something. are way more interesting than whatever Compi thinks, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about e6. I don't you know. I, I, we weren't looking at the computer, but um, was your intuition you didn't really that wasn't your first one just because you felt like knight d2 f3 and then you have to worry about the dark squares or what was your like initial intuition? Well, it's a bit hard to say what the intuition thinks, right? I'm just saying mm -hmm. kind of what first uh sure shoot sure. out at me, but uh. Yeah, like in retrospect, yes, like like knight d two, knight b three, bishop e three. Yeah, the dark squares. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you allow them to have that structure, then that could be a bit problematic in the long run. But maybe that's only if they open the c file, which may or may not happen. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's hard to say. I um, I kind of think I prefer white in general, but maybe I'm wrong. It's it's hard hard to say. All right. Um, okay. Like I would probably intuitive, I would probably choose white, but I did see what the engine eval was briefly, so <laughs> I could be corrupted. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not giving the wrong answer. <laughs> what do you mean? Sorry. Well, you didn't see that the engine said black had an advantage, and then you said, "I think white's better." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think the engine was saying zeros from what i saw briefly but it's uh, at a lower depth on leeches so i don't know if it's like put too much stock into that but yeah um mm, i would probably slightly prefer black i'm sorry probably slightly prefer white but yeah i'm not uh i'm not 100 percent sure it's i haven't really gone deep into the position yet so it's hard to say alex what do you think about um nepo's approach today because he's clearly uh, trading everything off. They're in a rook yeah. and opposite color bishop endgame now. Yeah, well, I think he did that a few times in the previous candidates, right? Like when 
I mean, there could be many factors. He might be preserving his energy because there's like four games in a row without a rest day. So it's a little bit more uh, energy demanding tournament than the last few candidates where the rest day would be after two or after three rounds. Now it's after four rounds. So, you know, that could be tough. So you need to preserve your energy. He is leading currently the tournament. Bobby is the one slightly behind. So maybe he just wants to play it a bit safer and kind of have a shutdown game and then just prepare to have the energy for the finish line. Um, mm. Or maybe he just woke up not feeling very energized, right? Like sometimes you just feel a little bit sick. You maybe didn't sleep that well, you know, could be many factors. Um, so I feel like that's a really good point and something people don't often take into account. But yeah, like if you wake up and you're not feeling well, it'd be a bit irresponsible to go for like some super sharp line and like just go all out anyway, knowing that you're probably not in your 100% best form. Yeah, especially not against Fabi, who was picking up his form. He had a lucky escape yesterday. I think he's definitely was looking for a fight, looking for a chance to maybe take over with Black if, if given a chance. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes perfect sense for Nepo to try to shut it down and play very risk-free. Uh, and this kind of strategy, he's been doing that. I think he did it a few times in the both of the last few candidates. I remember he did that in the pandemic resumed thing when Nepo mm -hmm. played against Anishigiri with White and he just kind of shut the game down, not take too much risks and stuff. And, uh, you know, later it was right because he was like running away with it and Anishigiri was the one chasing him. But imagine if he would have lost, he would have lost the tiebreak edge, right? So at that point, maybe he had more to lose from, especially with Giri surprising him, maybe. I don't, but um, so I remember, I think that, and uh, of course, last year against Hikaru, although that was when he was almost r wrapped it up anyway. So yeah, I think, uh, I think he knows himself very well by now. He knows what works. And uh, although against Ding, I have to say it didn't work very well. I think he did that in game 11. Uh, in the World Championship match when he was leading by a point, and uh, he just shot it down, even though he had a clear advantage at the point mm -hmm. when he shot it down. And uh, Ding was a bit vulnerable at that point. Um, and I feel like if he would have found a way to press in that game and win, then the match would be more almost over. But instead, he drew that game. He gave Ding maybe a little bit of confidence. And then game 12, was, of course, was that crazy game where Nepo could have easily won, but he didn't. And I feel like maybe that was... Um, the sign of like maybe playing it too safe. So I guess with with any approach, it's like finding that balance and it's never easy. Um, and as much as I tell my students at a lower level to try not to take draws, but of course, yeah, when you're a professional and you're playing an elite level, it's just the rules are different than like at a club level. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to, um, you know, uh, hard to say. We'll, I guess we'll find out after the tournament. But at the moment, it makes perfect sense, I feel. So we'll see. Uh, you guys, why don't we let's go to the Prague game, mm -hmm. and we'll get Alex's take on it. Maybe well, we start with uh, move, yeah. move five, okay. move five, or four. We can start with Black's move four, mm -hmm. provocative, going and then going for five. the semi tarash. Well, semi tarash, I don't know. I don't think it's provocative. Right. First of all, it's not clear if he was gonna play after CD four if he was gonna play the real semi tarash with knight takes D five. Or whether he was going to play C takes D4, which is considered the Berlin of the D4 openings, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> so it's not clear. Um, My so, guess is he was going to play the Berlin. <laughs> maybe, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, so, so already it's not. Yeah, probably yes. Uh, so already it's not clear. So I think Prague wants to fight with the boss of, with White for sure, right? And and my memory is my memory right that we had the same opening with Prague being black against Vidit. Gook. Round... Vidit was black. Vidit, Vidit in round yeah. one. Right? Yeah, and it was Gook. a crazy game. But it's notable it that the two Indian juniors came to the tournament probably with the same idea in mind against the uh, semi Tarash, right? To play E three and just get a game. They're willing to play either mm. side of an IQP or a hanging pawns or whatever. So. 
For me, I think it's Prague seventh move B three. That's quite surprising. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, B three. I don't think I've ever seen before. Yes, I mm -hmm. think I thought usually they resolve the tension in the center at this point, like D C followed by B four or mm -hmm. C E or whatever. But right. B three was a new thing for me. It was obviously still prep. It was played very quickly, and then a boss of reacted relatively quickly and then take take bishop e7 uh white played c5 b6 yeah i'm not really sure what's going on a very very unusual position mm -hmm. um yeah it's, it makes sense like white wants a fight uh Prague definitely wants a fight with the boss of because the boss of just lost a very difficult game right and if Prague wants to win the tournament well he has to win with white against the boss of especially with white mm -hmm. uh, so you know clearly he wants to keep pieces on the board and hope for the best and see what happens yeah now from my chump gm perspective i would rather be black in this position um the one at the, the end or on, well, sure at the end you know uh in general like this pawn structure it's always a bummer for white because that pawn on d4 is usually pretty weak but obviously the claim that white's making is they have enough juice on the queen side to compensate for the structural problem, right? Um, well, also yeah. it's not clear if the bishop on c8 will be a problem or not, right? Like right? unless yeah. black can go bishop b5 at some point, it's not going to be that easy. So I feel like, yes, if, um, if white does not get any initiative or then I guess black will be better in the long run. But I, I think I've seen the structure before where white can definitely put pressure on, on black. So right. I would say it's very double-edged. Yeah, uh, yeah I, agree but I would that. probably slightly prefer white, but you know, that's mm -hmm. just me. Can I ask uh, the, G, the, the the GMs about something here, or maybe Kosia will know as well. When black played B6 here on move nine, I would expect with, you know, A3 and D4 that B4 would be a major candidate for white trying to hold that space advantage on C5. Mm -hmm. I... Mm -hmm. Any any thoughts about that choice where he just traded off immediately? My sense of that position is if you go B4 and BC is played, unless you think you can get away with DC, you don't want to do it because BC will be a nice position for black with the knight holding the C pawn, the D4 being a weakness. That's my general sense of it. Sometimes you can get away with B4, BC, DC, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know, obviously those center pawns by black, you know, they are going to have something to say too. Yeah, then you're kind of playing a note boom kind so, of yeah. situation. Yeah. Which I've yeah, seen people I... playing sometimes now, these kind of structures, playing them aggressively with mm -hmm. black out of Queen's Gambit declines as well. Yeah, I think, you know, before it's probably very interesting also, but yeah, also there's like 94 plans all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. trying to exchange knights. And then going bishop f6 so it's never it's not really that clear right? it's yeah. like comes down to concrete uh stuff so i think what white did makes perfect sense actually so okay um, all these all these positions if black's bishop on c8 were out on f5 or g4 i would really see them as not promising for white yeah but, I, for sure but the bishop on c8 you know gives me some hope about some of these things right like i'm not always mm -hmm. losing my pawn on d4 without a bishop on g4 and mm -hmm. and so forth um but okay thanks for the answer so I'll, I'll move ahead to the to the live position folks so we saw Prague dodging that knight trade that uh that black often goes for in these positions one of the main reasons black's going for it is you know d4 hit the knight on f3 win the pawn on d4 and make way for bishop f6 as well yeah so Prague avoids that but that's you know it's definitely a concession that the knight just gets to live on e4. Queen b8 instead of a7 takes a little pressure off d4. David, can we go to... I want to go on a small rant, okay? Can we just... Let me just go on a little rant. Cue take the rant. Back. Somebody let, clip let it. Take, yeah, here we go. <laughs> take it back to move six, please. So, so uh, after a6. I just want a tiny rant. Just allow me a tiny rant. Yeah, get it out, Jesse. So we just get, I'm just going to get it out. I got something on my chest. I need to get it out. So forever, people like Magnus, and even way back in the day, people like Capablanca were saying, ah, the openings, 
They've been all figured out. And Magnus is like, I don't play classical chess anymore because of the openings. And so I just want to say out of this position with A6, for me forever, it was thought, and I think this is not just me, but forever, it was like the plan was DC, bishop C5, B4. The bishop goes somewhere, and then you get fancy and play things like queen C2, maybe bishop B2, and you do some stuff. However, right here, we're going to see a new idea with B3. And then in the round one with Vidit versus Prague, we saw this amazing DC, B4, bishop moves, and then rook A2, rook A2. And so to me, it's just an example of like, no, boss, the openings are not dead. That is an illusion. And the reason it feels like an illusion is when you were in a position like me and other chump GMs, and we played DC, B4, Queen, C2 all the time, we felt like, oh, that was just the thing you had to do. No, that was an illusion. It was not the thing that you had to do. All right, that's my rant. Uh, yeah, fair, I, th I think, I th I think, um, I think the truth with Magnus is that he just simply did not want to play another match like this, right? Because there's a common expression that says like every match is like a few years from your life, right? So I think he just simply doesn't he doesn't need to really prove anything. I think he just doesn't enjoy the process. He doesn't really want to lose, right? But he also knows that for him to win or to have a very good chance of winning, uh, for him to be a real favorite, he needs to really put in all this energy and stress that he has to prepare for like months before. And I just don't think he wants to do that work anymore. When if he, and he, if he feels like if he doesn't do that work, then he won't win and he doesn't want that, right? So he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. So he kind of made some, you know, kind of semi excuses like this, which, well, of course there might be some truth to it, but at the same time, you know, you saw how Magnus, he had happened, like he, went for a fight against Sergei Karyakin. He went for this like knight of three and whatever poly system or whatever. And guess what? He overpressed and lost and he almost lost that match. Right. So it's not that simple that you could just like play chess and then just like win. Right. Like it depends on your form. It depends on a lot of factors. Right. So it's, uh, it's not so simple with Magnus. I mean, I think he has a right to do what he wants. Right. He's not really hurting anyone. He's not really obliged. To play chess i think there are some other things that i did not like what he did i probably shouldn't uh shouldn't say too much about no but, get into it you, you well, can like say I, what you want alex but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna <laughs> interrupt for one second to say folks you see how well alex is prepared imagine him in his chess games he has listened <laughs> to multiple jesse rants on dojo talks <laughs> and he he knew in advance what <laughs> what the talking points were he was ready for this <laughs> Yeah, I just want to interject. He says Magnus hasn't hurt anybody, but he's hurt me, okay? <laughs> he's hurt me. It's true. He's hurt one person. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the truth is, like, he, like, let's just say he would have played the cha the the championship and he would have lost. Then you would have also hurt, like, a bunch of fans, right? Like, it's like, uh, no matter what you do in life, you can't please everyone at the same time, right? Like, so that's kind of the philosophical way, like, because... You know that's just how it is right like it's um you can't please everyone yeah. at the same time and you, if you have uh, to pick we... one person to not please let it be jesse <laughs> I mean. well, well i don't know about i i don't know necessarily about that but uh but okay uh that's <laughs> uh i like your banter quite a lot you guys uh really have a lot of fun with like uh a little bit this trash talking each other it's, yeah it's and now you're fun. part of it Welcome to the dojo. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the dojo. dojo. <laughs> um, but yeah, in all seriousness, I don't really like how Magnus handled the whole station with, with Hans. So, you know, that was something that uh, potentially, yeah, I, I didn't like. But uh, okay, other than that, uh, I don't know. I think also sometimes he's reacted to some losses in a very difficult way, which maybe did not set good examples. So those things you can argue that Sometimes Magnus did not show himself in the best way, but again, you know, he's uh, nobody's perfect, right? And I think he's still a great world champion. He's done a tremendous lot for chess. And I've also done sometimes things that are not perfect um, to people. And uh, I feel bad about that, but that's that's just how life is, right? Nobody's perfect. Uh, he's still a great champion, still respect him a tremendous bit. And, um, you know, I think... Uh, you know he has a right to do what he wants when it comes to his chess. He's he's earned it. I feel 
Um, but yeah, that's actually in a way that's true without madness in the cycle that makes people maybe take a bit more risks and they're more inspired to play this whole candidates because they know that they have a very good chance of, of winning if they get through to the world championship match. Or well, at least much better chance than when it was Magnus at the end, uh, which looked like a very tall order for although Sergei Karyakin had a real chance of, of winning. Like he yeah. just a couple of small moments away he would have became world champion. So uh and Fabi also had like very decent chances. And even Anand you could say that had he found this tactic in game number six, um he had a chance. Mm -hmm. And I would say Jan also if even though the, the final match was lopsided, if game six would have gone a little bit differently, a couple of small nuances there, that could have changed the tide of the match completely, right? If somehow Nepo would have taken over at some point and won and not made a couple of mistakes right before time control. So really, like every match, I would say, except for the first match that Anon, I mean, Magnus beat Anon, that was like a one-sided match, relatively speaking, where he just won those end games. I feel like all those matches then, they were competitive, they were close, and anyone could have won at some point, right? Like, but especially Sergei. So in reality, it's like, um, you know, Magnus was beatable, and he understood that at some point he might not win, right? So it's, uh, it's so, and to, to do all this work and still not win, that's a very unpleasant task, right? Yeah. So he just wanted to enjoy life. I so. think he'd even reached a point where if he won, it was still not worth it right yeah exactly yeah like even yeah, if you told cool. him in advance you will win the match he would still say but i have to spend four months preparing just for this match well if you told him in advance that he doesn't have to do any prep and yeah. he'll win then I'm, then I'm sure he will I, play but yeah. of course that's not how life works yeah he, you know, in fact he might not do he might end up doing a lot of prep and still not win right, right. that's and so and that would be a a pretty big bummer, right? And that's one of the reasons why I sort of stopped playing chess because I realized at some point I see a bunch of my chess friends uh, trying very hard, you know, to become better as adults, you know, become from IM to GM or, you know, stuff like that. And I'm not even meant talking about, uh, you know, Kosti or David. I'm talking about some other friends that I have. Um, and I just see how tough it is for them despite the fact that they're working extremely hard. So... I just decided for myself, you know what? I'm just gonna coach from now on. It's just not worth playing anymore. If it's if it's this hard to get a result, like like now I'm like what like 150 points from even trying to qualify for the US Championship. There's just no motivation to try to play. Just to maybe have a great tournament once in 10 tournaments, and maybe once in a while win the US Open, and then get last place in the US Championship. Like what's what's <laughs> the real point there, right? Like it's just. Um, it's just not fun anymore, right? Like so, so then I want to invest more time and energy into trying to become a better coach. Where I still have, uh, I have to, I have a lot to work on as a coach, but at least I feel like I'm in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like I understand Magnus completely. He realized he can't be, he can't get to 2900 like he wanted, right? At some point when we, we just reach our plateau, right? Like Magnus is frustrated he can't reach 2900. I'm I've, I'm frustrated. I I, ha I have no chance of getting 2700. I am are frustrated. They can't get to 2500. And the list and it goes on and on. <laughs> An expert who was there for 20 years, they're frustrated. They can't get to master. And it goes on and on and on. Right? Like it's um it's just like once once we reach a plateau, it's it's extremely hard because um you have to work on your personality. You have to work on and it's like nonstop. Like you have to work on your skills right it's like because unfortunately with adult players relapses happen too often like you can get you can play you can do everything more or less perfectly for one tournament but can it be sustained like you see anna zatonsky had a tournament of her life uh and shout out to her she won karen's cup but did that translate into future good results see that's what i mean right like it's just very hard to sustain like this the, the sustainability is i think the hardest part in chess like i think we can say about all adult players that on their best day and their best tournament, we can all play 200, 300 points higher. Like on a good tournament, I can play like a 2700. But unfortunately, and on a good tournament, my friend who's not a GM, he can play like a 2700. He can play one, one or two games, even like a 3000. 
But the problem is sustainability. It's the consistency. And I have no idea how to fix that problem. And uh, if somebody knows the secret, maybe I'll go back to trying to play chess. But for now, uh, I'm just going to invest into my coaching for this reason. Alex, I think everyone in chat just quit chess after your speech. <laughs> <laughs> just... Depressing. Oh, man, I should give Depressing. up. I'm going to be on a plateau one day. <laughs> I'm sorry that I, I just put on such a damper, but I think I was just kind of trying to explain how Magnus thinks, but then I just I just let out a big rant about my No, it was it was it was beautiful. It was very very honest and uh, I felt every word uh you said. But okay, we should we should go back to the games and, and look at some of these positions. Yeah. So Coach, do you have a feeling do you have a feeling oh, where we ahead. should go? Or Jesse, maybe. Um, let's let's look at Naka because I, I think this is an interesting position to kind of analyze a bit. The Vidid game also looks uh, super fun. Um, but Naka, he went for this move Queen C seven, mm -hmm. which think, and then um, he played E six. Then he played E six. Yeah. Okay, so he kind of well, Queen C seven makes sense if you're not gonna play F six, right? Like if you're gonna go E six, Knight E seven, C five, Knight C six. But I suspect he probably studied this position and he probably knows typical ideas. That's why he played. Um, this way. He probably studied this position and, and decided that it's okay for black. That's why he probably knows all the typical ideas as well. Mm -hmm. He wants to play for C5 and, and challenge the dark scores like that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's a little... Um, I mean, I'm sure he has his ideas, but just my first glance at it, it's controversial because um, w one of White's ideas is to play for c4, and then if we open up the c file, then obviously the queen doesn't belong on c7, right? Um, no, it does so because it defends the seventh one, right? A c6 one, right? In the way. Well, I mean, I'm just saying when White's going to try, one of White's plans here is to play c4 and mm -hmm. cd and then put a rook on c1, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's oh, yes. Well, I was thinking after c4, maybe Black could take on c4, no? Maybe something like that. I'm just saying, like Queen C7. I'm not. It's not a hundred percent to me that it belongs there. That's, That's the only true. thing. I'm That's saying. true. Yeah, we don't know for sure. Yes. Mm. So a chump GM like me would have just played ninety seven in castles and sees what see what uh, White wants. You know. Yeah, maybe that was better. I. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, because I agree. Yeah, it's called principle of don't declare your intentions. Yeah, I mean because the Queen is like a very flexible piece. We don't really know where it belongs. But on the other hand, he declared white, right? When he played queen c7, he asks white a question how he deals with that pawn. And you can argue, well, the rook on e1 may or may not belong there, right? So it's like, there's also that argument. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, hard to say. I had an idea I considered for Gukesh here, which is b3 with the idea of bishop a3. And um, I was kind of thinking it might make Naka bring the bishop back to f8. Mm, well, I think b3, knight e7, bishop a3, can't we play c5 in that case? No, and uh, the you can't. rook c8 if needed? I don't think you so. can, because queen b5 check, and then your coconut drops. Well, he ah, played yeah, b4, which was also true. on my radar. Oh. And David, I think that's this might... Have, he's trying, I think, to get something similar to what you want, which is to put the, the dark square bishop on that diagonal. Yeah. So, like, if he can arrange... He would love to arrange bishop e3, c5. Me too, but uh, how? Because e5 is always exactly. hanging. <laughs> the other simple thing, though, is after b4, you could just say, well, one idea is knight d2, b3, mm -hmm. right? And one thing that also he might be saying, I'm not sure about this, though, is that if he had played knight d2 instead of b4, I was going to say maybe he was worried about c5. I don't know, though, because queen b5 is kind of annoying in that position. That's yeah, pretty annoying. I think but, you need to be developed before you do that. In any case, if we imagine, like, black playing knight e7, knight d2, we at least can see what white's claims are with a knight coming to b3 and then some kind of occupation on c5. So I play some simple moves like this. Plop a knight, plop a knight. Yeah. And so he says, I'm controlling c5 and a5. So those pawns are a little bit bad. And uh, since black's played e6, they're not as well placed to play f6 without dropping the e6 pawn. And um, it's a little hard to 
to figure out where black's going from here, isn't it? Right. And the other cool thing is maybe we could say that when we look back at Rook E1, that this plan was part of his conception, where in that position, if we're going to play B4, we don't really want the bishop on F4, which would have been logical if we wanted to play Kostya's knight D2 F3. In this plan, we're looking, we're dreaming of someday putting the bishop on, on the uh, G1 A7 diagonal. Mm. Guys, I've got a question. What if Naka just goes A5 right now? Like, what's the intention for white? Yeah, that's what I was also thinking. Yeah, Very but it, are you question. really threatening anything? I thought if black gets a b, that's that's very good for for black structure. I thought I don't know. It could be yeah because takes takes and then at some point if you get c five in, then uh, yeah you get the pass pawn on the d pile. Yeah, it could be for sure. Um, I yeah, was thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking you just play knight d two. Yeah, I think I think at some point they gotta also stop playing fancy moves and bring out the pieces. <laughs> also a five knight d two, maybe a four could be interesting for Ben. Maybe. Maybe, but then you lose all of your chances over there. That's true, yeah. That's well, a very tense position, not not easy to say. Um, aye, aye, aye. Yeah. That's why the players are thinking for a long time here. Um uh, it's not easy. Yeah, I mean, you're, it, you are making it very slow for that knight to get to c5 with that pawn on a4. Um, very, very slow. Uh, Merles has an idea to bring black's knight to c4. Uh, as soon as he sees b4, he wants to go knight e7, probably get castled, but then go knight c8, knight b6, knight c4. So... Ah, uh, yes. Be, yeah. So like this basic line I gave where we put White's Knight on B3, right? Maybe there he says, yeah, you've got C5, and this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll say about putting the Knight on C4 is that um, when you look at this game, right, it's a game for who controls the blockade squares, i.e. the dark squares. So we're talking about C5, D4, E5. All of these squares are going to be central. And if you put the knight on c4, <laughs> well, first of all, it's going to take forever. But second of all, that knight is really needed to fight for the dark squares. Okay, 97 played. So I'm anticipating, let, let's play guess the move. I'm, I'm anticipating knight d2. Yeah, knight d2. It's like weird a to me, here. though. It's still, it's still weird to me that he played b4 before knight d2. So maybe he has some other idea that I don't see yet. Well, before, he played before to maybe stop c5. Because okay. if you go knight d2 immediately. Oh, no, he didn't play c5 because queen yeah. b5. Yeah. Queen b5, exactly, right. Yeah. So knight well, although, could have king, been... although maybe king f8 is not. Yeah, so... that's what I was thinking. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to go there with the king f8, but maybe that was his fear. Yeah, here it comes, knight d2. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you can live in fear of king f8 in this position. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> that can determine what you're doing. Uh, yeah, maybe not. Although then e5 pawn might be hanging. That's the thing. Um, so I wasn't sure, but okay. Yeah. Yeah, and you might see this King F8 like... in online chess from Black, but you wouldn't see it here, I think. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> and Kaki well, is that's talking why about not... F4. Okay. We might play F4 someday. We might do it. But first, we're going to put the knight on B3 and just see what happens, I think. Um, Sorry, guys. I think I have to uh, I have less than like five minutes. But uh, uh, No problem. Listen, it was great to see you guys. Maybe... Yeah. For another round, I'll stop by. Maybe, maybe even later to that tonight, if I have a, a few minutes here and there. Sure. But uh, I wanted to thank you guys for uh, uh, having me here, and also, yeah, I apologize if I said some something that might have no, been no, discarded. No. <laughs> but uh, but at the same time, um, I do think that in life everything is possible. Now possible but very difficult right like but very difficult does not mean impossible right it's just i decided for myself that it might not be worth it anymore but just because it's not worth it for me it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be worth it for other people like i think struggling through chess in many ways it helps in a lot of other life activities and uh i think it's good for 
to really struggle through things and uh, persevere. Like struggling is not necessarily a bad thing, right? So I just wanted mm-hmm. to uh, kind of emphasize that, right? So even if you feel like you're frustrated, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It means you care. It means that you're growing in many other ways potentially. And, um, you know, so I will say that it's not just black and white that all oh, struggling, losing means bad. It's, it's not like that at all. And I don't want to be interpreted like that. So uh, I encourage, wish you all the best in your journeys, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully I'll join you guys for some later today or maybe some next few. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure today and I, Hopefully it'll be some really interesting round. Yeah. Oh no, he played night C eight, dude. Oh no, time. I'm wrong. Great to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> Without castling even. Woo. Yeah. Okay. I had a I had a whole idea. I was gonna be Alex. What do you think about my idea of I wanted him to play C five, sack the pawn, get the knight to C six, you know, go for it oh. and knight C eight, dude. I don't like it. I'm but not really I, but, sure. It's that it's it's. I think in a position like this, anything might be playable, right? It's just it's very hard to stay definite. Anything definite in a position that's this strategically complex. So, uh-huh. I, um, we'll see. Okay, I'll see you either later today or later this week. Right, thank man, you man, again man. for having. Thank you. Bro. Thanks. For thank you, Alex. Alex. We'll see you soon. All the uh, best. Uh, bye bye. Thanks. Okay, David, I think I might have an idea of what's going on with knight c8. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, shout out to the person who said knight b6, c4. I don't think that's what is happening, but I think the idea is we want to play knight b6 to d7, Mm -hmm. cause white to lose a tempo on the e5 pawn, and then break with c5. Yeah, I was thinking that too, that the knight, once it gets to b6 and it's a step away from this beautiful square on c4, it might actually just go to d7 and contest this c5 outpost that Gukesh also spent a lot of time you know building up for it saving up for that square so you can spend some time stopping it i actually was thinking if black goes for this then white's idea would be to go a3 and c4 and then eventually bishop b2 mm-hmm. and just try to hold the uh the c4 square yeah, you could do it that way. There's no real need for you to play a3 right away. I mean, but yeah, yeah, I'm thinking like maybe c4 first, knight b6, then a3, because bishop b2, knight a4, maybe somewhere could be not. Maybe bishop b2, knight a4, bishop d4 is okay. Yeah, maybe c4 and bishop b2, and then rook a c1, and then the queen on c7 starts to feel a little uncomfortable. Now, because I'm a lamo. Mm-hmm. I would be, I think the lame thing to do here might be to play knight b3, knight b6, knight c5, and just be like bows. I don't want to see that knight go to d7. I don't want to see it. But it can't yeah, go just, to d7 then, right? Well, then I would take it. That's what I'm saying. I would take it. Oh. And I'd say, gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but he wants to trade knights with you. So it's like, it's. I don't know what kind well, of gotcha it is. Well, you know, it, it's a lame plan, but I would play f4 and then bishop b3 to c5, you know. Do I have something special? No, but, you know, I I think black, I, I kind of, I still believe in black. I, I I really like my idea for c5 sacking the pawn, but I understand what dude is doing with knight b c8. Okay. Mm, we got to go to Ferruja. Yeah, we've okay. got calls for this. Pawn has yeah. been sacked. A pawn has been munched. Yeah. Look at this. Mm. Yeah. So everybody's excited about this because of some things that Vidit's done, including castling queenside, and then in this position, pushing g4, a really going for it kind of move, right? Going to kick that knight, start a pawn storm, just in case the king ever moves that way. Um, but it also is sacking a pawn. So it's everything we, it's everything that us crude chess players like. I, I'd say Vidit has done everything like, according to the book like for this line like queen d2 bishop e2 this g4 push i think is very thematic even sacking the f pawn is definitely something i've seen in very similar positions Mm -hmm. i've never seen this exact position but definitely a thing that um white i think should not fear when they play this by the way we're talking this is all about my openings rant this queen d8 move i think is only two games and queen d2 was already a novelty Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's very familiar. I was, it's funny. I was, well, you guys, while Lenderman was talking, I was looking at this and I was thinking, 
on G4 and I was like, oh, I, I wanted, you know, G4 first instinct. And I was like, oh, hanging the F-pawn. And the problem is, is if he doesn't take on F2, then he has to deal with this very simple plan of G5, uh, Bishop E3, F4, and then mm -hmm. all the coconuts are, you know, getting rolled back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing is if G5, Knight D7, then white can think about taking on D6 too. Right. Yeah. So, um, let's just this... throw, let's just throw out a basic tactical point in this position so that people aren't too lost, okay? Because, I mean, D6 is attacked three times, right? So we just have to let people know what's going on here. If bishop takes okay. D6, in general, the reason white doesn't do this is the move rook D8 for black. Now this is not going to work every time for black, but you know that's kind of that's kind of why that pawn is is often left hanging because of the rook d8 move. So that's why um, Kosi's saying once we've kicked this knight, then d6 is very very munchable with no rook d8 move coming for black. Bishop takes d6 is going to weaken black's dark squares and activates white's rook and queen. And I want to say the value of taking the pawn is that later, if I can get a knight to e5, you're never going to mess with me, right? It's like, it doesn't matter what happens. As long as I get a knight to e5 that you can't push me away with f4, then I'm just not worried about a thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in that line, g5, knight d7, bishop d6, some kind of taco, we can we can we can do the taco a bunch of different ways, but we will eventually be playing for knight c e five. Oh, sorry. And we're just gonna say bows. I'm never moving. You know, never moving. Yeah, but the thing is, like, I mean, there's tactics, right? Knight takes b five, oh, yeah. pawn takes, bishop takes, and white says, I mean, if you won't move, you'll die where you stand, right? I mean, just attack all those. Mm -hmm. Well, someone's getting welcome to the dojo here. That's for sure. And one thing I want to stress in that line is you could do it. You don't have to go e5 right away. You could play rook d8 first. You got other options. You know? mm -hmm. Ooh, actually, there, there's a nice tactic there if you go rook d8. Okay. That I missed, that first missed. Where, where so do you want go, it? Go back one. Mm -hmm. With g5, so, knight d7, or not? Uh, sure. Yeah, with g5, knight d7. Okay. Uh, bishop takes, yeah. bishop takes, queen takes, rook d8. Uh, queen c7. Yeah. Going and then my this. first instinct was that queen b6 would save us, but Defending then everybody. rook d7. Yeah. I saw. Yeah. Welcome to Puzzle Rush. But you know what? It's it's me again who's lost, because queen e3, welcome to the dojo, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sicilian labyrinth, my friends. Oh, dang. Yeah. Well, then I just take it. Oh, it's still, it's all about getting welcome to the dojo back. It doesn't <laughs> Jesse's just rolling down a hill of welcomes. <laughs> bah, 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 like in a cartoon, you know, they're donk, 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 donk. Oh, I guess white's way. Oh, I guess black's way. Oh, <laughs> Where's my eval bar, dude? Where's my bar? Oh, you guys, I got to run. I'm hoping to be back later, but I got to go deal with some life stuff. So I'll see you guys soon. All right. All right, all right bye. Sounds good. Took him off quick. That was getting hectic, huh, Kostya? Yeah. yeah, crazy. Um, these positions are getting hectic. I wanted to say, I, I would love to see a conversation between Alex uh, Lennerman and Hikaru. Because I'd love to see Hikaru go into his, like, I don't care about this tournament. It's all about streaming, content creation. And then Alex, he'd be like, look, Hikaru, it's okay to care. You know, everyone cares about stuff. Like, that doesn't mean it's a bad. I just, I would love, I bet Alex would be a great coach for Naka. I bet he could really like get a, get his mojo back. Uh -huh. <laughs> but doesn't, doesn't Naka have his mojo more or less? No, you're not, you're not, you're not completely. He sure looks he a lot better balance. after winning that game yesterday. That's for sure. <laughs> like everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, okay, so okay. where are we at with this? So Vidic Queen F2 has been played, and Vidit's thinking. Now, a lot of times you'd be like, you sacked your pawn, dog. Why are you thinking, right? Well, if you were Jesse, you would. Uh, you probably <laughs> wouldn't say dog on your own without him around. But uh, sometimes you'd say, hey, if you sacked the pawn, didn't you have an idea behind it, right? But yeah. I think 
white has so many possible ways of handling this. I've had positions like this sometimes where I'm confident I can sack the pawn, but I haven't necessarily decided in advance what's the best. Yeah, option. it might not be practical to calculate it out because you might, if you have several options, and I think this is a point Fabi makes a lot. Like if you have several good options, then you don't really need to choose one ahead of time. You just need to believe that at least one will be good. And then if dude's crazy enough to take the pawn, okay, then we'll set and calculate. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So options, um, right? There's g5 to take the d6 pawn. There's rook mm -hmm. f1 to just go after f7, right? And then, you know, g5, maybe bishop h5, maybe g6. Um, I would like to know, can we just determine real quick, does, can white force a draw here with bishop e3, let's say queen h4, bishop g5? Just before we look at anything yeah, else. Yeah, the like, one square to try to escape to would be h3, with the idea of bishop f1, queen takes g4, maybe finding some space. Um <laughs> But hardly this feels... Not a lot of space. Playable. I mean, the odds that you Rook can't get a perpetual five. against the queen are pretty low. You could probably... Rook dg1 looks like game over, right? Yeah, in, in that position. Um, okay. I don't think Vidit's going to make a, a draw here. Post. Yeah, that's a good move. Yeah. But if I was playing this game, I would be... I would feel good about that. Like, all right, I have this. <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, I don't think you feel bad as white. You just feel like some pressure to play a complicated game getting low on time, right? That's a little bit of an issue for Vidit at this tournament. It's just being a little bit slower. Yeah? Yeah. By okay, the way, let's... I think Frugia looks terrible today, how he's playing this game. The time on his clock, mm. the risky position, it... I mean, it almost feels like he pl he's played Blitz last night already. You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it it doesn't it doesn't feel good to me. Obviously, I'm not even looking at the cam and his expressions and all that. You'd you'd have a much better idea of reading body language, posture, and everything. But this looks pretty rough to me. Yeah. So some folks in chat are saying that e5 might be. A pretty cool move for white here as well so that's that's interesting i think bishop e3 forcing the queen off to the king side so she can't rejoin that's pretty darn tempting to me kostya yeah bishop e3 it feels like the move but i mean i think it's this is definitely the moment to think for Vid. I don't think you play Bishop E3 and then start <laughs> start no. thinking, you know. Yeah, I agree. Because maybe this E5 thing is uh, is really strong. Yeah. Um, definitely was not an instinct for me looking at this position. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the E5 move. I think they were starting with D takes E5, although Knight E5 looks very viable to me as well. I think they right. were starting with D E5 and then revealing the idea of Knight E4 attacking the Queen on F2 and trying to is it called deflect? Well, here there's queen f4, so I think the knight. we're missing something. We're missing something, huh? Like maybe bishop e3 first. So bishop e3, but now we don't get that tempo on the queen, do we? Knight e4. And then I think bishop g5 was the continuation, and then queen f2, and then knight e4, when the bishop's not hanging on f4. Oh, nice. Black does also have queen h3 there, which I think they might want to do under the circumstances. And now we'll go knight e4. And, uh, okay, so the idea is to checkmate on d7. Black's defensive moves are pretty much rook d8, knight d5, bishop e7 is less good than those other ones. Hmm. Uh, Patrick, in that one position where you want to checkmate, you can't because your queen is pinned. That's what Kostya was telling me a second ago. Let me show you what Kostya told me. Kostya told me that if I go knight e4, queen takes f4, knight f6 check, I won't be allowed to do this. I can't yeah. carry out my mate. I'm glad you tried it, though. Yeah. Always keep chess.com honest. <laughs> you want to check every now and then if it's programmed correctly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so um, where are we at with this? Well, it looked like a mess. I don't think we got any conclusion just yet, did we? Here, here, 94. I mean, this 95 move, that's a possible defense, no? 95, yeah, Rook D8, I, I didn't see the knockout for white either. Yeah. Um. But could we look at E5, Knight takes E5 for a sec? Yeah, even though this already wondering... didn't work out, I, I also wanted to like get 95 on the board early on. Curious. Yeah, I guess maybe bishop takes e5 and no, then g5, knight d5. Um, but, it, but allowing bishop e5 here looks. Oh no, no, there's bishop b5. Okay, okay, that's that's simple, simple. Where? Just on knight e5, bishop b5. Without even taking. Oh right, because you just take the queen. We're not even setting up a mate. No. Ah yeah yeah. Okay, that knight is uh, gonna have to stay where it is. That means you also have the candidate move here, cozy of just bishop takes e5, right? Just. Yeah. Exactly. Whatever. But I think rook d8 is going to be annoying mm -hmm. uh, if we don't have a good square for the queen. In theory, if rook d8, we just had a good square for the queen, and then they play rook d1, rook d1, that's actually good for white, right? <laughs> we trade black's rook that's covering some of the mating squares, leave them with the rook on h8, get the rook off h1. It would be good news, but I just don't know where the queen's going. Okay, so it's e5, d e5. We're going bishop e3, the queen's going to h4. And now we've got, you know, knight e4, knight d5 to wonder about. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, big, it feels like a big chance for Vidit. I don't know if the c5 thing is good. Um, feels like it's based on some some stuff, but technically, I think Nepo and Fabi they were maybe still playing, but it's not super exciting so far. They're going through the motions. <laughs> uh, I would say mildly less exciting, fewer possibilities than Vidit versus Ferruja. Exactly. Um, I don't see a knockout with this e5 line, honestly. Chat, I'm inclined to maybe play g5, bishop d6. Is that really weenie of me to want to get my pawn back? I'm opening a file. That's what I'm really doing. I'm opening a file. It's the marketing. It's how you frame it, right, Kostya? We're not pawn mm -hmm. grubbing. We're opening files when we take our opponent's pawns. Uh huh? Yes. Well, I know Abdul wants... It's what I said. As soon as I say something about taking a pawn, it summons Abdul. <laughs> <laughs> Abdul, our resident pawn grubber. Yeah. He's like... he's like, It's more than just like a pawn grubber. He's like the god of pawn grubbers. Like, when someone's going to take a pawn, first they like pray to like Abdul, right? They're like, let Abdul be with me. And like you know, whatever, put a benediction upon my pawn grab. I know you said you don't like how Fruja looks today, but yeah. he's wearing a very fancy yellow shirt. Okay. So I like yellow. He is putting in effort. It's not like he just showed up in sweats and uh, right. messy yeah. hair. No, I, yeah, I was... Yeah. I... I... <laughs> In addition to the clothes, Kostya, if you've seen his cam, like, does he look, you know, concentrated, nervous, you know, upset? Oh, E5 or... played. Holy moly. Nice. Chat and Vidit are on some insane wavelength. Good lord, and X clams are coming in here. The X clams are flowing. E5. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
it's like it it must be like the spectators in Rome with the gladiators, right, Kostya? Like there's mm-hmm. something about seeing other people's blood flow that just <laughs> it's what the spectators <laughs> want. It's what they want, you know. When Prague was throwing his pieces at Nepo yesterday, I mean everybody was happy. Everybody. Absolutely. Oh, and Fruge has just sunk. Oh man. He does not look happy. Surely Fruge understands it's over. No, guys, they don't they don't got it's over. the eval bar next to them, so they don't know. <laughs> they never know in these yeah, kind of middle he games. He just saw are. this move E five. He's calculating. Like they, um, they, they know are. once they calculate like a maiden three or somebody's lost their queen. But when you just have a complicated position, you're like, I'm busting him. No, like they've seen these positions go both ways a million times. You know? Yeah. But for sure, he, you're never happy if your opponent tanks and then plays e5. Because mm-hmm. you, you do have this, you do have this fear that, oh, did I just completely mess this up? Yeah. Jack Gleason is on to like a really big thing, though. It does make you feel really, really good or, quote, like a GM when you predict the move of a super GM, right? I mean, it's, that's a good feeling. If you're calling for E5 and then Vidit plays it, then suddenly you're just rooting for Vidit forever because he played your move, right? Absolutely. Well, on this one, I'm definitely rooting for Vidit. <laughs> Yesterday, not so much. Today, for sure. <laughs> I was rooting for Vidit yesterday. He had a good position. By the way, Coach, you remember when he played Queen G3 and Fabi was thinking? And we were like, mm-hmm. this was obviously Vidit's plan. Like, why haven't you prepared F6? When you played E5, you were, you know, there was only one move for White, which was Queen G3. You surely, like, had your plan. Did he just notice something? Did he hesitate? Remember that whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that Fabi overlooked Queen G3. He literally played E5 wow. thinking like this chump is just going to retreat his bishop and lose E4. And then Vidit played Queen G3 and he's like, he's, oh shoot, I'm the chump. He said that in the interview. Okay, that's that's shocking, David. That it's, shocking. it's shocking not just because, okay, we, we found the move, right? And we're not no, using not the engines that. or anything. It's shocking because it's a very thematic idea, right? You see yeah. this in so many Sicilians. Like he's seen this idea a million times. He's had to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure he's... I, I mean, I've seen it in games of his. <laughs> you know? I've seen it in games of his. His queen switched to g3 in a Sicilian. You know, with the black pawn and e5 queen on c7. And also, it's like... Vidit is a good player, right? The guy plays bishop d4. If you don't see queen g3, you're like e5 wrecking him. Huh. And then yeah. you really look like... Wait, but he's... But he's not like, you know, a three-year-old kid... He's, you know, one of the top players in the world. Like, he must, he must have something. But yeah, we all have just weird momentary right. blind spots, right? Mm-hmm. And so somehow he look. I'm sure he has the attitude to look for what did it up to. And for some reason, it just didn't click that one time. Yeah. And and sometimes it's like you even know your opponent has an idea, but you you just can't find it for whatever reason. And you... You just play the move that, you know, you, you feel like you have to play because you just, just can't figure it out. And then they show you, of course, every time <laughs> what they had in mind. So, um, wow. You know, kudos to Fabi for being honest about that, though. I yeah. Mean, I think a lot of players would not have been that honest about <laughs> yeah. missing it. Yeah, he definitely didn't invent it. There's nobody out there trying to encourage their opponents to assume that you're miscalculating one move deep. There's nobody, like, trying to project that aura, I don't think. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Driven says it probably helps in the long term to have a lack of respect for the opponents because it gives you that encouragement to push for wins. It's that optimism. And I think optimism is better than pessimism, but there's also over-optimism. So it's like you need just a touch of optimism, but you need to be really realistic as well about your opponent's strengths and, and treat them with a fair amount of respect. That's that's yeah. my take from my own. Hey, Gukesh played my move. He went C4. Oh, wow. He's playing all kinds of moves, huh? Well, let's see. Okay, Next I like Gukesh now. Because he played my move. <gasps> there we go. Now you're going to root with me for Gukesh? Yes. Only now. <laughs> Fair 
fair enough. Dude, he played that queen ending Kostya. It was it was beautiful. He went all the way yesterday. That that was a very very fascinating queen end game. Did it make it into your wrap up at all that Gukesh was awesome? I might have mentioned it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the main point I was trying to express was that queen end games are are hard. Yeah. Um because you know, I had to run the game through the engine and it was uh you know it was a bit back and forth with, with the evaluation okay um and like the uh, queen ending yeah. went back and forth between winning and drawing you would say yeah a couple I times Kukesh never like lost the queen ending yeah he was never losing <laughs> yeah but it definitely oscillated with with a draw and a win a couple times um and every time you know it's just like it's very difficult to to understand. It's just a super concrete thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, th those complications, like from when Abasov gave the pawn back with ninety six to the queen end game, uh -huh. it's just like I mean, those were kind of insane for me. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I didn't even want to like try it. I didn't even begin to break down like what was going on. Oh, when he just like backed off the d3 pawn? Yeah. He must have thought he had some tactic with knight f4 that was going to just win him the game if white took and he'd miscalculated something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um but but yeah, I was just very very sure. Yeah. As people have said in chat, you know, Nepo and Fabi, it's officially a draw. They found somewhere to trade rooks eventually. So, that game is in the books. Uh, that's how you win tournaments, folks. Sorry to break it to you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Nikki Lesh. Very nice of you. Um, but we, we've got some pretty intense games here. Um, Vidit mm -hmm. versus Ferruja. E5 played. Knight D7 just retreating is Ferruja. Well, he's got a D6 oh, wow. pawn okay, in so they, now. They both must have figured something out after D. E. Good God. I mean, Kosti, do you, do you plant a pawn on D6? Or do you go knight e4, knight d6, and keep the d file open? Ooh, I like knight e4, yeah. It's hard to choose. Knight e4, knight d6. I once survived a game, Kostya, where my opponent played e takes d6, uh, and I didn't have the dark squared bishop, and they got bishop g5, bishop e7. Mm -hmm. But I traded queens and just played around the d6, e7 pawns and won the yeah, end game. Yeah, that's... Only good in bug house. Just Sicilian endgame. <laughs> e6, bishop e7. <laughs> All right, chat is going for knight e4. They're calling it gg and so nasty. Knight e4 does look really nasty. I mean. All right. You got it right, Connor. You know that good feeling of predicting a GM move? You predicted Costa's commentary. That's pretty good. <laughs> Knight c5 may be interesting. Knight How many C5 times is queen going to hit b6? That is a <laughs> wild move for white. I mean, black's got that covered a whole lot of times. Knight c5 would be a heck of a somebody tripping. <laughs> Knight e4 would welcome Ferruja to the dojo. Knight e4, wow. General Blorp, we're reading all the chat. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. Against knight e4, does he play queen b6 for the third time? Presumably, so. yes. <laughs> this queen is magnetically attached to my, that square. My magic eight ball says odds are yes. Why is Ferruja playing so fast? He spent the night playing blitz and he's still on tilt. That's just a theory. That's just a theory. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I don't think he took yesterday's game well. Yesterday's oh, no. game, I mean, he he would have probably been pissed he if he drew yesterday's game, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. I think he'd be pissed if he drew yesterday's game. Well, it did. Um, I don't know if you guys, how much, uh, what you were looking at exactly when you were following the game, but I, he had, like, a very clear draw when he played F6 check. Uh, right? Like, he, he in that position, we don't have to spent too much time on it but like he could have taken like the d4 pawn they would have gone into like a rook end game and it would have been a, a dead draw mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah i know but he mean. played f6 thinking okay I'm either he's him. well either he thinks he's winning or at least he thinks he's the one pressing yeah 
Uh, so clearly he was trying to win that game very hard. Yeah, yeah. He had a lot of options. Um, yeah, Jesse and I were just arguing about different ways for White to win around that phase. Because we thought when he got like F4 in and Rook G2, we thought he was really coming steaming back. Mm-hmm. Um, should we practice trying to calculate this for White or should we just check all the games and see what's going on? Somebody told me that Tan's game was interesting and Tan Zhang Yi is currently in the lead in this tournament. So I'd queued up two of the women's uh, candidate games in advance that I thought would be interesting today. Tan, who's in the lead. Let's take a quick look. Yeah, Tan's position looks uh, beautiful. She's down a pawn with a... Well, okay, tactically, she's also got queen and rook and bishop hanging. She's down a pawn with sort of like a, a ready-made killer attack, but it looks like she's going to have to invest a lot of material in it. Bishop d4 may be forced, but she's thinking. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, maybe she's thinking about queen g3 right now. Uh -huh. And then the intention would be rook b2. Hg okay nineteen four three. She didn't save her bishop. That's why she was thinking also. she's that crazy. Wow, self pinning and keeping the piece hanging. <laughs> yeah, she's just giving all, trying to like play the least possible predictable move of okay. all. But that that's actually clever. That's similar, I think, to the idea with queen g three. Like on rook b two, she's she's popping, she's popping another piece, and the knight clears the third rank for the rook to come to e three. Holy so, moly. I'm going to guess it's going to be very bad for Black if she takes on B2 here. Yeah. Oh, man. My instinct is Tan is killing her. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's, that's a brave move. Yeah. It looks, it looks like a bad French. Yeah, that? but the intention, folks, I don't think it's to pop on E6. I think the intention is to pop on G6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the knight can't go to e6 unless black plays rook b2. For the moment, it's stuck, but it'll have its chance, perhaps. I was thinking, you know, if she just played bishop d4 and then c3, she would never lose that bishop, and she's got a ready-made attack and great comp. I thought, easy move, you know? But no. Yeah. But no. Holy moly. And I'm curious how much time she spent on knight d4. Yeah. My thing isn't doesn't telling say. me exactly, but... Yeah, according to just a calm one second. Eh, I don't think so. <laughs> seems unlikely. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out something to folks. See this rook on f1? If you play against an opponent and you don't really know their style and they've got this rook on f1, they're trying to mate you. They played rook ae1 because they don't care about the other side of the board at all. All they're doing is mating you. So just be aware. Just be aware. When they trap their own rook, it's because they can only see your king. Here's a little tip. Let's check on her yeah, country if you, um, woman. If you go back a couple of moves, oh, she yeah. spent a lot of time on h4. So maybe she did already see some of this beforehand because it was h4, rook a4, and then I think h5. Mm -hmm. Looks like it was played pretty quickly. Big move. Big move h4, yeah. How is knight takes e5 not an issue? I don't see what to do. Well, good question. I mean, we'll start with rook takes knight. Um, now, were you maybe thinking of playing bishop f6 and going after all white's pieces? I mean, this was a non-trivial but very interesting move, bouncing across. Let's let's assume you were going to play bishop e5. And then Kosian and I are going to wonder if we can sack on g6 and leave the rook hanging. This is the position Tal was talking about when he said his opponents could only take his pieces one at a time, right, Kostya? The, the exact one. Yeah, I think it was just a blunder, David. I think this was not uh, an intentional oh, no? sack. Oh, mm -hmm. didn't see the rook on e1. Okay. I, I still thought it was very interesting. So your instinct, I think, suggested a a complicated But I think variation. white has a easy bailout with bishop c3, if nothing else. Bishop c3, ooh. Maybe bishop a3. Yeah, just, just keeping it simple, huh? 
Okay. Tal might roll his eyes at you, but that looks pretty good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I like Tal a lot. I just I just need more Tal in everybody's lives. I want to check Lay's position as well. Oh my goodness. That game was fun. I saw that was a King's Indian. I believe the only King's Indian in the candidate so far. Yeah, and it might be the last. <laughs> it's looking terrible. Terrible. I was disappointed to see that Lay has black because I'm, I'm still needing her to win several games to fulfill my, my prediction. But this is not. Yeah, is this really so so bad for Black? Knight takes d5. What I'm seeing is that the two pawns are advanced in front of the king with an open, 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 open game. Okay. But yeah, I feel no, like there's more to chess than that. But... There is, there is, <laughs> there is. I'm just saying that was what I saw, and then it sort of overrode my evaluative function. Mm -hmm. You're saying Knight takes d5. And you've summoned Abdul. Abdul yeah, says Abdul. knight takes pawn. <laughs> knight takes pawn. Guys, take the pawn. <laughs> you notice when we're talking about anything else, he was silent. Yeah. Well, a lot of people, you know, they watch streams uh, in the background while they, you know, do work. Right. And stuff like that. So maybe we do summon folks uh, occasionally. Okay. So bishop, right bishop takes d6, commentary. right? Bishop d6. Keeping the bishop pair. Oh, a move was played, by the way, and it was not knight takes d5. Lay. You can go back to work, Abdul. <laughs> Lay didn't take the pawn. Um, well, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm sure she figured it out. <laughs> it's yeah. not worth it. Yeah, I mean, I can say, like, I checked knight e3, folks, and I was planning rook f8 check to get out of the, uh, whether you call it a fork or a double attack, it's up to you. I was planning rook f8 check, bishop f8, queen d2. And then this is exactly where I'm like the black king, right? <laughs> Some of y'all have easy jobs. We've got multiple people whose job is petting their cat. Nice. That's like even that's easier than job. that's even easier than chess streaming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This position would be terrible, right, Kostya? Um, queen d2 yeah, this doesn't look good. Yeah. Okay, so the move was knight e5. Oh, wow, she didn't lose her d6 pawn yet. Hmm. Can I take a moment to calculate? or? Sure, let's think about it. All right. All right, none of my fun moves work. We can go somewhere else. <laughs> Farusha's played queen b6 again in the background. Another queen b6 from Ferruja. Yeah. We'll be back at that game in a second, folks. Um, I'll just tell you knight e5 doesn't win for white here in any obvious way. Um, maybe bishop takes e5 would be better, but that's not a dream. So I'm thinking maybe just the slightly boring queen d2, you know, connecting rooks, developing pieces and whatnot. seems pretty good i i i think uh my my prediction on lay might might be about to expire I, I would say here. if queen d queen d2 black's knight gets to f5 I, I would think black is uh okay here okay well you've heard it from the from my king's indian guru 
but Coast, Coast said you, black's okay. you have to you have to believe that you're okay otherwise you can't play the opening it's very mm -hmm. hard <laughs> so you always have to believe <laughs> you always have to believe so i don't know i'm not i'm not objective in these positions so I'm... yeah Okay. Uh, I'm feeling pretty bad for white, but uh, live position is 95 has been played. We may poke back in on that, but right now I'm going to just go around the bend, update the prog game, and then focus in on Vidit. So bishop f6, bishop e3 was played, which I do believe allowed e5 as a candidate move. 97 was played instead, so he's going to f5. David, I'll be RB. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought about this position a little bit before, folks, but I don't want to go too deep into it because it's not going to be our focus. But, you know, Black's pressuring D4, maybe playing E5. I thought Bishop B2 would be played. Some folks in chat also said this would allow E5. Um, knight E7, Knight C5. Bishop Knight C5, okay. Weakening White's light square. So now if this bishop can ever get out, which is possible, um, it's going to be a beast. So white's going to have to be careful about that. And the knight gets to f5. Black could get two bishops against two knights. And Prague is just proudly building up that little queenside pawn majority, looking to gain space. Rook fc1 and a4 kind of moves coming next. Still kind of like Prague's position, probably. As long as this piece is suffering and this pawn can't move and he's got this majority, somehow... Maybe it's just uh, maybe it's just player prejudice. Like I just sort of believe in Prague, so he's doing this, and then I believe in it. But I kind of like his position. Let's go check out Vidit. Okay, Patrick's with me. Patrick likes the two knights as well. But maybe Patrick also is just a a Prague fan like me. All right, so here we had e5, knight d7. That it simply took without the 94 that evoked so many excited squeals. Takes here. Just retreats because, you know, you're going to hit hit 94, rook f1 anyway in a moment. And Vidit's thinking. And this is, um, this is, I think, the biggest issue for Vidit and Gukesh both so far this tournament is they're just playing so much slower than the other players. Um I think it's I think it's really hurting them. Um like yesterday Gukesh uh you know he had a good position against Abasov and like the last couple moves of the time control were shaky and he had one minute with no increment to make four moves. So of course they were shaky. Um it would be surprising to me, honestly, if they made it through the whole tournament without blundering a game at some point due to time pressure. And obviously, I want Kukesh to win the tournament. And obviously, he one of the things he's doing is he's calculating super well. And he's putting in that effort. But, I mean, the time control is, is risky. And just being so low on time consistently game after game you do pay for it at some point, I think. Almost anybody. Yes, Kevin James is absolutely correct. These are people who can play entire games at a higher level than most of us in a blitz game. And that's true for, you know, maybe 9 out of 10 blitz games they play, Kevin James, are better than my classical games. I didn't, I didn't carefully investigate that number so it's not guaranteed to be right it might be eight not nine or something like that but a high percentage of the three minute blitz games played by Vidit or Gukesh or you know probably anybody else at this tournament are going to be better than my classical games in quality however those one or two games those one or two games they play that aren't better they're playing a 14-round tournament, right? I'm just saying it's going to cost them once or twice. You see what I mean? They're not infallible in those three-minute games. If you look through, you know, 10, 12 of those games, 
you'll find something aberrant somewhere in there. Um, so I, I, I that this is just my take, and I could be wrong on it, right? But it it makes me nervous. Obviously, I'm rooting for them. I'm not trying to criticize them, but I think it's really risky. And my, you know, yeah. My, my nerves are, are worrying when I watch Gukesh, and it's been several, several rounds like that. Uh, and you, you just know that eventually something's going to go wrong, I think. So like here, look at this beautiful position he has. The only thing you could say that Vidit might not win this game is he's got 40 minutes to make 25 moves. Right? He hasn't even made it to move 20 before using up, you know, two-thirds of his time. So he's likely to be at move 20 with something like 10 minutes or less and Fruta's position is bad but is Vidic going to checkmate him by move 20 or is he going to have a game that he still has to play you know I think it's um I think that's really going to be his Achilles heel this tournament it's hard to adjust something like that really significantly mid-tournament especially when we see the problem like four or five times in a row um and the same for Gukesh um so, yeah, I mean, Gukesh is probably getting into time trouble as we speak, Noah, if we click over here for a second. Oh, is he alive on the clock after all? No, I thought that when Hikaru castled, he was 20 minutes ahead. So does that mean Gukesh played bishop b2 and Hikaru's been thinking for 20 or 30 minutes just on this move? Or is my game not, like, not caught up for some reason? Sometimes... Your board doesn't update as fast as other people's boards. Yeah, so Patrick is saying Ilya Nizhnik blundered a rook against Patrick in a 5-0 game and still won, but that wouldn't fly in a candidate's game for Vidit, right? Like if he's winning against Ferruja and then he hangs a rook by accident and he's got, you know, three minutes and ferruja has got an hour on the clock, Ferruja's going to convert, right? <laughs> okay, so time is correct. Folks think that Hikaru is tanking after Bishop B2. So we'll come, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll come around to that game. It's obviously an interesting game for us. But I think Vidit's got the most violent position. So let's, let's think about his situation a little bit. He's been thinking about it a lot. Maybe some of you can predict one or two more of his moves. Uh, we've got a suggestion from Tom here. To maybe go rook h e1 with ideas of the knight could get to d5 and hit c7. That looks like a great idea, Tom. I love that idea. If that knight comes into d5, it's hard for black to uh, ignore it. Hard to ignore it on c7. Black's hope is that this pawn here kind of blocks the aggression of these white pieces. And black wants to be shielded by that d6 pawn for long enough to arrange some peace trades, maybe connect the rooks somehow. So, um, so I think knight d5 is actually an extremely strong looking plan. Rook f1, of course, makes sense because you could just try to make a threat against f7 to make progress. But, um, you know, now that knight d5 has been men mentioned to me, um, yeah, I, I, I pretty much like that. My instinct is certainly that white's winning. And I think my instinct is to play rook he1, as suggested, yeah. Well, when we play rook e1, it's not necessarily to sack a piece. It's like we're going to play knight d5 at a point in time where we can see that it wins by force. Yeah. If you're going to sack, why not finish development? I will, I will. His suggestion to Craddock, to be clear, was to play rook e1 first. And then see if next move we can play knight d5 or threaten it. And in fact, he said maybe rook e1, bishop f3, and then knight d5. I've got an instinct that if you play rook e1, you're probably already threatening knight d5 unless black plays a move that stops it. So. Does Fruge have to long castle against rook e1 to avoid knight d5? Maybe. Um, one of the things white would like would be to keep Fruge from castling. But if you can't keep Ferruja from castling, the other thing you would like is white is for him to castle. So you know which way he's going. And then you can hunt that way, right? If he castles kingside, you can start throwing 
these pawns. If he castles queenside, you can start you know, lifting rooks and preparing a sack on b5 to open up the king. Or there's like a maneuver where you go a4 to open up the king, and then against b4 you play a5. You have to set it up tactically. Here um, you can see, and this assumes the king's castled, right? Well, I can give you a more realistic situation, maybe like rookie one castles a4. So this is an idea to pry open the king once it's there, right? The idea is that you're trying to trade pawns to get closer to the king. And if they go b4, you want to go a5. And this doesn't work tactically, but the strategic idea is to then, your knight didn't have to retreat somewhere bad. And you've split up these pawns so you can, you know, attack them and, and, and work your way into the position. Now here it doesn't work tactically because pawn takes knight hits the queen and you lose a piece, right? But that would be something that you might start setting up. As soon as they castle queenside, you might be looking like, okay, how do I set up a4 here, right? Um, you would also have a very, uh, <laughs> tactically speaking, it's not a strategic element of the position, but someone's probably yelled this at me by now in chat, I would predict. Yep, Waximus has. Um, yeah, you have a... You have a tactical move that's just crispy critters. It has nothing to do with positional. But if we were to play this positionally, it would be something like, you know, queen d3, looking at a4 maybe. Or you could go bishop f3 and queen g2, putting pressure there. Whatever. Castle as long as illegal because bishop e3 wins the queen. So maybe he'll play queen d8 here. And then after bishop f3... Um, he might be able to save the game with queen b6. He can't go actually. queen d8 again. He's I cut don't... off. He's cut off. Hang no on, more Kostya. I'm doing a routine. You're interrupting my routine. So he goes queen b6. This might hold here for black. White might not have anything better than king b1 yet. And now you could prepare queenside castle and get out of this bishop e3 move with queen d8. You also, knight d5 doesn't even hit your queen now. And then... If we overprotect g7, we might be able to develop this bishop eventually. And yeah, I mean, I know I played queen b6 a few times here, but black's looking good. Black's looking really good. Patrick seems to prefer white. Kevin James as well. Knight c7 wins the queen. Okay. I like well, how chat's analyzing with you. Well... Well, you guys have your perspective on chess, and I have mine, right? So, yeah, maybe a small advantage after knight c7. That's a little bit more reasonable, Murphy. Without an eval bar, we'll never know, though. Yeah, without an eval bar, we won't know. We'll have to check the player interviews tomorrow. Uh, but, uh, that said, rookie won. Uh, he's not going to castle queenside. Not gonna castle queenside. I think we've I think we've all come together to come up with a really good plan for white. Rookie one, queen a seven. Yes, Kevin James. Yeah. Thank goodness for bouncing across, confirming that that bishop e3 winning the queen would be good. <laughs> yeah, so queen a7 with the idea that after bishop f3 or something, you could castle queenside and bishop e3 no longer wins your queen. She just goes back to b8 and laughs. Laughs. Fitted is still tanking. Holy moly. This is this uh -oh, is oh that's not good. This is grim. He's using too much time. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, I mean, it's a sharp position. You guys, you were thinking Rook H one, Bishop F three looks normal. I'm not really sure, like, honestly speaking, what Ferugia would do after rook e1. Mm -hmm. Bishop e3 play. It has just played bishop e3. 
How he's doing? How he has to go queen d8? Oh come on! Yeah. <laughs> so... Forced queen d8. Berisha, you're cut off. Unbelievable. I think if he played rook e1, you know, maybe Ferusha would have castled and he could have played bishop e3. No, I, I literally did not see a move for Ferruja after rook e1. We're just winding up. Yeah, I guess five. everything looks looks good for white. Um, In this position, like the live position, h4 looks like a nice move. Okay, so game position, bishop e3, queen d8. And you want to go h4, just taking some space or whatever. Yeah, just stopping uh, Ferruja's next move, Queen H4. Queen H4? <laughs> Prophylaxis. Uh, Luca, yes, this is winning for White. But I have said Vidic could, you know, flag slash blunder. You know, he doesn't have a 100% chance of winning here. But if you go to another stream and check their eval bar, or if you load the games yourself, which you're all welcome to do, you know, here's here's a here's a link to the games. You know, you can see all the games here. You know, if you want to, you can load an eval bar and find out that Vidit has an advantage. If that's if that's what you need, it, it will confirm that. <laughs> <clears throat> I would move the rook, Abdul, yeah. So, I would move the rook off of h1. I mean, the bishop is on b7, but also my rook would be better on e1 or f1, I feel. Sometimes cavemen tactics work. Tell me about them, Dan. What 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 cavemen tactics are you referring to? I was worried earlier that you didn't realize that I was just joking when I moved Black's Queen back and forth six times. Yeah, Vidit was generally winning the game against Fabi yesterday. I don't know exactly how much time pressure played into him blowing it. It was a tricky position to play. Yeah, it was it was tough for Vidit, you know. Um, apparently, it was his queen e five move that gave up the advantage. Yeah, which we I don't remember us spending any time there. I mean, we didn't have a lot of time, but we had no idea that that's where. That's where he lost it. Yeah. Uh, Kostya, he played bishop e3 after thinking for almost 17 minutes. There was literally one legal move for Ferruja in response, queen d8, and he's back to thinking. So It's not good. He's got has to make 24 moves. I mean, his position's amazing, but... Unfortunately, it's... I have to say, it seems like he's going to lose the game in a winning position. I, it's not inspiring confidence. Yeah. Is he maybe he can go bishop b5? Maybe he's calculating all the way to checkmate or something just for fun. Maybe I mean he's he is winning like overwhelmingly, right? What if he takes on it b5? Looks fantastic. What happens? Pawn takes, knight takes. Let's try a line. I mean, I would just play rook to e1 or f1. I would hardly think. Mm -hmm. Um but I would do this and a knight b5. And black can't really stop knight c7, right? Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Uh, I was going to say rook c8, but a nice line, I thought, is uh, if f6, mm -hmm. knight c7 check, king f7, mm -hmm. and go knight takes e6. Good, good destruction move. Some folks who like caveman tactics will appreciate this move. Knight takes e6. The king can't take because of mate. And, you know, it's just some some good old-fashioned thrashing going on here. <laughs> um, he's played a move, though. Let's see what he's done. Rook H F1. Okay, good. Fine. Good that it's fine. If that were the product of 10 seconds of thought, I would say good on you. Four and a half minutes? I don't know. 
Now here's a question: What is Black's next move? Like G six? It's very difficult here for me. The weird thing is, it feels like Ferruja's moves would be harder to pick, but he's been banging them out somehow. <laughs> I feel like when you don't love your position, you just you play fast. You just get it over with. Yeah. No, this move looks good. Uh, it's very hard to pick moves for Black. I think you said it, Kosi. Maybe Queen H four. <laughs> um, with the idea of then castling queen side at some point, maybe rook c8, trapping your king where it is. Rook c8 feels like a move. Yeah. Good God. Yeah. Normally we play queen b6 as Ferruja, but here maybe right. not. It's not available. Can we prepare queen b6? Prepare queen b6 somehow. Try and recover that square. <clears throat> What does did it want? Somebody asks. I don't know. To give his parents a heart attack, I guess they must be watching somewhere, and they're like, "Move, son, move." <laughs> I mean, white white has many ideas in in the position. You can put the bishop on f three. You can try to set up uh, some kind of knight d five sacrifice. You can double on the f file. Yeah. Um, you can advance, you know, g5, h4 just to... Because, okay, the big problem for black is that it's like, it's not even clear where the king will be safe. Even if he give it, gets time to castle, which I don't see how that happens either. Yeah. I think the basic thing you would do here next is white, honestly, is you'd improve bishop e2 and knight b3. And then start looking for knockouts. Can you just take on f7? I think you would need the bishop on e2 out of the way so you have queen f2 for that to work. I feel like this bishop would need to be striking at some other light square. e6, g6, something, and the queen have access to the f-file for you to have the ingredients for rook f7. Yeah, if you put the bishop on b3, then I think rook f7 starts to feel yeah. interesting. But here, I don't. it's not a threat. Like, See how the white queen can't really move right now? For all the fact that black's pieces can't move, white's queen can hardly move. Right, And then the bishop e2 and knight b3 I would both call passive. So that's not really where I look for knockouts when I've got a bunch of pieces that could improve a whole lot. That's where I look for moves like, you know, rookie one, bishop f3. So. And yes, you can consider bishop takes b5 as well, just because it might end the game. And, you know, it gets the bishop on e2 out of the way. 95 played. See, look at that. Ferruja came up with something relatively fast there. I mean, he played that faster than Fidit developed the rook on h1, which was a much easier move. <laughs> that rules out rook f7 as well. What do we want is white. Bishop on e2 can't move. Want to ramp up some pressure somewhere. Huh. Nothing super obvious for white here. Oh, but he's played his move faster. Good, good job. Queen d4, getting a little bit more space for her. Queen d4? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It was on my list of moves. Is this somehow playing against g6? What's his idea? Let's see. I mean, I think partly the idea is improving the queen. Um, it may also allow you to play for moves like knight e4, knight c5, with the queen's help. Um, hitting e5 makes maybe knight takes b5, pawn takes bishop better at some point. It's just just a just a piece improving move. I think it's pretty decent. Yeah, it looks fine. Um, let's see. I'm going to check on Tan. G6. 
g5, bishop c3, rook a4. Okay, nothing too dramatic. At some point, chess games came in and said, check out the tan game, but he had just seen what we'd already talked about a minute before, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, we were on that game. Humpy Canero, bishop trade, trade, and the push. Yeah. Just a pleasant Posityatsk, but not fully decisive yet. Naka played a5, a3, and a Tradovich. And a Tradovich. I think Naka has uh, has held Black's position successfully, Kostya. Yeah, this one is looking um, drawish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was like so unusual strategically, but now it starts to, I can start to see or feel the balance in the position. Mm. So, yeah, I think a5 was a good response there to White's well, good, C4 um, idea. Good prep by Naka once again with Black. He picks this kind of unexpected line mm -hmm. and he's well prepared and seems like he had no issues equalizing in this one yeah yeah he's got plenty of time to play the next 20 moves and a fine position yeah healthy game now Vidit is not known for like when things simplify just agreeing to a draw and I know you know they can't offer a draw but there's the unspoken just going into Tausch Machina mode, right? Where you just yeah plop your pieces on, on obvious squares and the opponent plops theirs and you play really fast and just trade stuff off. Gukesh kind of has a tendency to grind absolutely anything. Well, he's not mature enough to make a drop. Yeah. You know, he's still a kid. Right. <laughs> So, so the question is, is he going to try and grind an equal position against Naka, get low on time, and then... I mean, Naka's all about pouncing on that. Yeah, exactly. It, depending on how much Gukesh wants to press, Naka might uh, get some chances himself, like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Gukesh got in trouble against Abbasov, right, from a good position um, when he was low on time. Also, I mean, he took a super equal-looking position that other people would have agreed to a draw and gone into Tausch Machina mode. He took it and he grinded it and he won, right? So there's both sides of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Yeah, I know, I know, guys. Hikaru's, Hikaru's very strong, stronger than Abbasov, um, you know, in, in defense and avoiding getting ground. Um, so it could turn out worse for Gukesh. You're just, you know, talking about what Gukesh does, you know, the, there's the plus and the minus to it. Close that game. We don't need it. Let's check in on Prague a little bit more. What do you think of this position, Kosti? The last one we saw, and there's like four or five moves for us to add to it. But mm -hmm. I'm curious your impression here as we really are getting into the middle game in Prague versus Abbasov. So I'm yeah, at... I thought um, it's a pretty ambitious choice from Prague. It reminds me of um, like some Panov attack positions. Um, but uh, game really heated up, so okay. whatever we think about Rook B1, I think, is quickly going irrelevant. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I thought Black might play E5. I mean, I didn't think with majority, it's just it occurred to me that he might go for it. Uh, Rook D1, D4. Okay, so that looks like a pawn sack that the bishop on c8 might triumph. But Prague didn't take on d4. Huh. Oh, because of h2, huh? Hmm. He doesn't have a safe way to, to take on d4, leaving the rook at the end without mm -hmm. giving back the pawn. And then it's wide open. Wide open. Okay. So he played bishop g5, just... Looking for a random square. <laughs> I, I don't. I, 
I don't know the reason for that particular square. <laughs> Just going somewhere. Uh, bishop on e5 gets touched. Probably moves away to d6. That makes sense. And oh my god. Prague unleashes. Mm -hmm. Well, now I see why, why you said that whatever we think of the strategy around and the evaluation around rook b1 has become very irrelevant to the game. And then look at the response. No less yeah. feisty. Just H6. fighting. I mean, if he just backed up his knight, what was Prague doing? This g-pawn is just like an, a gaping open wound. Um, but where does black go? Uh... Okay, I guess I can't go 97, can I? If I go 97, it's takes and here and takes. And black ends up down a piece. Mm -hmm. So it would be knight h6 would be my square, Kostya. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess he... He didn't want something like bishop h6, knight e4, something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe knight e4 first, yeah. Knight e4, hitting the bishop, should be 7 and then at some point knight d4 maybe to cover the g-pawn. And then, yeah. you know, the question is, do we have counterplay with queen f4 and this bishop pair? I mean, black has no pawn that is not isolated. So... Definitely got to play for the initiative. Hard to judge intuitively. I feel like white is doing well. Mm -hmm. Maybe rook b3. There's a classy move. Yeah. Okay, so he was considering something like this. I mean... Yeah, so h6 from black makes a lot of sense because... Yeah. It, Seems like White has to uh, move the bishop away, and right. then, and then he can play ninety seven. Then maybe ninety seven. Okay, but what will Prague do? I mean, he could do anything. He could play G, and he's played a move. He just like played it. He just played it. I haven't seen it yet. But... Queen e four. He could play Queen e four here. That's what he did. That's what he did. Wow. That's um, an ob extremely obscure move, Ghost. Yeah. It's. I'm having trouble understanding because, okay, if black goes h g five, mm -hmm. does he have a move other than g takes f five? He does. He has a second move, which is maybe not good, but knight g five. Maybe that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, now let's figure out if it's good. Knight takes g five. <laughs> okay, so on g six, you have g f five, bishop f five, queen h four. That is good for white. Sorry. Give me it again. So if g6 for black, yeah. then gf5, bishop f5, queen h4. Looks good for white. Yeah. Agreed. That's an attack. So knight g5, I think a counterattack, like bishop h2, check, king g2, queen f4. Oh, the rook on a8? No, you can't give up everything, can you? Queen f4. Mm -hmm. That's my attempt for black. Oh, it's a complete mess. Honestly, a complete yeah. mess. Um, but this actually looks good for black. Because okay. we're still down a piece. Nine on g5 is hanging. Yeah. Maybe you can take on a8. Like, you might even have to. Yeah, Patrick, when we say good for white, it's just, uh, it's not because Kosi and I don't see queen h7 mate. It's just uh, sometimes we do a kind of poetic understatement, you know, like we'll win a queen and say, eh, white must be somewhat better. Yeah, it's not the worst position he's had all game. Um, it's British. We're trying to be British. <laughs> they're always very understated. In American TV shows about British people. I don't know if no, every are. time I see like 
David Howell, Luke McShane, uh-huh. any one of these like super strong English guys, you know, like they suggest these like brilliant moves and it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, it doesn't seem too bad for white. I'm okay. like, dude, it's like you're crushing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it is British confirmed. Matthew Sadler, I'm sure is like, yeah, not, not too bad for white. HG5 has been played. I think Prague's just going to take the knight though. I don't think he's going to do the crazy knight G5. Yeah, he does. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Okay, so then what was the point of starting with Queen E4 just to scare the guy? Oh, Patrick says you're right. Patrick says Sadler does it a lot too. Yeah, it, just to scare the guy, just to like knock his socks because he could have played pawn takes knight, pawn takes bishop, Queen E4, right? If that was really what he was into. Yeah, easily. Um, yeah, I don't know. Prague's just feeling beastly. I love the two knight versus two bishop duel. It's very weird. <laughs> very weird. That bishop on c8, Coasty, he's trying to like checkmate it. That's what he's doing with his queen. Look at it. Look at yeah. that. He checkmated that piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, We might need to go back to Vidit's game because okay. I'm confused about something. Did he flag or checkmate? Rook c8. He's, he's doing some weird stuff, in my opinion. Came in. So yeah, queen a7, bishop c6, queen a6 is on the board. What's weird about that? And then that? what's his intention on rook a8? Oh. Bishop a7? Like Karpov. Just bishop a7? You know, just the Karpov. positional Karpov, you know, bishop a7 to win control of the a-file. But is this really... Is this really clinical? Not exactly. This Here's another possibility to get the queen out of dodge, Kostya. Maybe you like uh-huh. this better. Knight b5. That's more like it. Okay. Rook a6. Rook a6. Knight c7. Queen c7. Pawn c7. Uh-huh. Rook is attacked, right? So I think it's going to go to a8. Mm-hmm. And you may have already seen this movie before. Bishop a6. Oh, Bishop a6. I have seen that before, but it's always nice to see the classics again. <laughs> um, okay. Nice to revisit that the makes, classics. I like to reread this book. A lot more sense. <laughs> that makes a ton of sense. Thank you, David. Yeah. Welcome to the dojo, says Patrick to uh, Ferruja there. So, yeah, maybe not Bishop A7, folks. That's maybe more of a of a joke. But this Knight B5 looks like crushing, right? I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that, that line's very convincing. Oh, my God. Rook A8's been played. Ooh. The question is, did Vidic calculate some of this stuff when he played Queen D4? Because it's a little bit obscure and hard to predict that this would happen. Like he played queen d4, and black moved the rook away from a7, right? So could he really have been playing queen d4, calculating weird lines with queen a7? I don't know. I, I thought he spent some time on queen a7. He did, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, did he look at this stuff before, or it's just an opportunity that just came up in the last two moves? Mm-hmm. And if so, you know... He only spent a minute on queen d4. Yeah. And if so, this is the kind of stuff where, like, you want to have some time on your clock when you're calculating trapping your own queen, right? But he did it super fast. Yeah. Um. So, Mooded, I think knight b5 is, is the winning move, right? But if you want to get into bishop a7, I do believe white's position has a good chance of supporting that move. For example, you said knight b8, queen b6. Right. And... I mean, black's queen sort of checkmated. B5's hanging, right? Queen B6, bishop B6. And it's just a simple positional win for white. They take on B5. None of the black pieces are talking to each other, right? It's, uh... Yeah, he's reaching. Vidit Santosh is reaching. Yeah. I feel like he's reaching for the B-pawn. Reach for the B-pawn, my friend. He's not reaching for the bishop on E. He has two legal moves, B-pawn and bishop E3. So... Well, no, frankly, his position's so good that he might win with queen c6 and then attacking the light squares. But, but I mean, oh, mainly, mainly it should be knight b5 or bishop a7. He goes Karpov. Goes Karpov. Oh, he does go bishop a7. Yeah. Wow. Sometimes you study too many classic games and you forget to calculate. No, I mean, he's, he's low on time. So if if knight b5 doesn't pop into your head... And knight b5 might be a blunder, right? I mean... 
You want to review Knight B5, Kostya, and see if you can refute it? Hmm. No, it looked, it looked fine to me. Um, it looked winning. Uh, I mean, I haven't refuted Bishop A7, but it's the kind of move where if things go wrong, <laughs> it's, it's an obvious... Well, you wouldn't blame Bishop A7, you would blame this whole excursion with Queen A7. Mm -hmm. But it, it does feel a little fishy. I mean, you would blame like 40 minutes spent on developing one or two pieces to obvious squares, and then one minute spent like sinking your queen into a trap. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, did it? Did it sees everything, so he knows what he's doing. But okay, but if he sees everything, what do you think of knight b five? Is it bad? Is it good? I I think knight b five was fine. If it's fine, he should have definitely played it. Like it's the dream of bishop a seven is to play knight b five. If you can play knight b five, play it. Mm hmm. Uh, maybe Marfinsky's line isn't super clear, like with bishop b7. Um, okay, rook, knight. Good job, Marfinsky. Thank you for that. Bishop, great. Right, 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 right. But, uh, I mean, even if you take on a6, I got to think that's good for white. I mean, you just have so many pawns. And rook for two pieces. Okay, I, I would think it's here's completely... here's a knockout. You go rook f four after yeah, you exactly. trade, and mm -hmm. then you go rook a four, rook a eight. Yeah, I mean, just looks right. terrible. Just like what we did with bishop a six. I mean, pawn on c seven is uh, strong. Yeah, <laughs> who'd have thought this pawn that no black piece can get to across the d file? Who'd have thought? Yeah. Yeah, if you try to stop me with knight c4, rook takes c4, exactly, Patrick. There's just there's nothing to be done. Oh, people are applauding. You guys are too too kind today. We've got a good audience, Kosti. We got a good crowd. You should try some some jokes. Jokes? Jokes. When you've got a good crowd, right? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe I'll try a joke or two. Some material, you know. Here's a joke. Perugia's position. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. I like it. I like it. Bishop Ace. So, I mean, yeah. If anyone wants to try and refute knight takes b5, have at it. Our working theory is that it was too low on time to... Uh, and was starting to turn practical and didn't look at every single move and didn't see it, but that it would have been crushing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, my eye just like flitted across the button you could click on to find out the truth, Kostya. Oh my God. Don't get tempted. <sighs> Actually, I did see someone suggest an interesting line um, <laughs> on Knight takes B5. Uh -huh. It might be a computer thing. Yeah. Um, it didn't cross my mind at all, but Bishop takes D6, Knight takes D6. I thought that was King a joke. King because it hangs the piece with check yeah no but i mean the idea is the queen is still awkward oh she can't come out because of this knight all the escapes <laughs> are covered so what so the idea is like king f8 there yeah it's hard to believe i mean there's oh still like you don't even want to see what i'm going to do to black now <laughs> oh you want queen c6 i want queen c6 i mean this is ridiculous <laughs> Look, if I had no time at all, I would just play knight f7 and you would resign, right? Yeah. I don't think yeah, this I person think so. used a computer because... Yeah, you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, but I want to play queen c6. I mean, if, if we're going to be here, we might as well have fun. Yeah. Once you say f, you have to say g. Yeah. No, this is just this is crushing. This is crushing. Okay, so queen a6, rook a8, bishop a7, g6. g6. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Some piece takes on B5. <laughs> Take on B5, yeah. Then I'm kind of out of things to say. I don't know, G6 is, is a very normal move uh, for black here. I mean, you got to get your, your bishop on the diagonal. Um, of course, it's just, yeah, it's queen side's falling apart. Right, yeah. There's no longer a queen side, so we go to the king side. And, you know, the thing is, I mean, I I would still lose this position, I think, more times out of 10 <laughs> than I would win it. As white? Against... Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think this is still, like, your king's on C1. Uh -huh. It's like a Banco Gambit, where instead of giving up one pawn, you've given up, like, three pawns, right? But there's still all the pieces on the board. Okay. So... I'm just saying, if Feruja, like, when, especially with the time, like, this is a position that's, uh, you know, very easy for white to mess up. You don't, you don't strike me as having a lot of confidence today, Kostya. Would you realize that to have this position, you would also have to be playing against a player playing as badly as Feruja? Would that not raise your confidence once you got to this position? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um... I don't know. Look, guys, I've seen some chess in my life. Yeah, you have. And I know that sometimes that. things go bad. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, this isn't... Uh, to me, this is not the simplest position with your bishop pinned on the A file mm -hmm. and uh, king on C1. Yeah. But I mean, I, mean I, I, get, I get that the engine is, is going nuts here for white. I get that, but... But have you ever seen somebody not convert a master, shall we say, not convert a position with four connected pass pawns? I'm sure I have. You've seen it happen? I mean, I've seen people lose all kinds of plus 10 positions. Yeah. My penultimate we game, I did that, by the way, Kostya. I had four connected What's pass that? pawns and I couldn't win. My penultimate game, <laughs> my second to last game that I've played in a tournament. Oh, okay. I had four connected pass pawns and I didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, stuff happens. I, I don't know if people have played chess before, but stuff happens, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a 30-second increment, which Vidit does not hear. As I predicted, he had less than 20 minutes at move Yeah, 20 hold on. 15 minutes for yeah. 19 moves? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Don't know. Here's what I think is going to happen, Kostya. He's going to play knight takes b5. Nope. Played bishop b5. All right. Here's what would have happened if I were playing white coast. Yeah. <laughs> he would have played bishop, knight takes b5. <laughs> bishop takes, <laughs> bishop takes, bishop h6, king b1, and black castles to safety. Um, but instead of castles, why not bishop e3? Then I would have played maybe like queen b7. Bishop e3 instead of castling. Yeah. I don't know, because I take your pieces. Bishop takes bishop. Mm hmm Rook takes queen, I presume. Mm hmm Materialist. Bishop takes rook. <laughs> Materialist. Okay, but white's winning because they have extra material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, white's uh, winning pretty no, easily. I think white white wins here, but yeah. uh, okay, it's already a queen sack that you have to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, bishop h six, king b one on the board. You obliged me to have some confidence. Yeah. So this was the he had to have bishop h six or he wasn't getting castled. Uh, take care, Gabriel. Have a good day. Thanks for joining us and for your suggestions. Okay, so now if bishop e3, he, he is sacking the queen somehow, right? Uh, well, he would take on c6, right? And just give the a7 bishop, but win a piece on c6. Oh, bishop c6. Yeah, okay. That's easy. So now he's got a knight on b5. So he is securing his bishop ahead of bishop e3. He's playing a very safety kind of approach. And against castles, he might play knight c7 to unpin. Castles played. Feruja, you note, is playing quite quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, at this point, that's kind of all he has. Yeah. 
<laughs> but knight c7, I guess there's still rook c8. Yeah. But, I mean, then your bishop on a7 is alive, right? Yeah, yeah your bishop's free. <laughs> yeah. So. And what's the score? Two pawns for, for white. Two pawns for white. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I mean, also the d6 pawn is truly an asset, right? It's not like a, is this pawn strong or weak scenario. It's it's requiring it's some tending. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you play h3 just just to prevent counterplay. Fit it, clock ticks down. We could watch a different board, but just like have Vidit's clock <laughs> added to our thing. <laughs> like we've got the whole like picture and just at the top or bottom of our template, we just have like Vidit clock. All you well, need to his know clock about the is position. His, yeah, his biggest enemy right now. Yeah. Don't need to see his position, just his clock. All right, he went for knight c7 to unpin. He's playing the like safety first moves here for sure, the last several moves. Oh yeah, yeah, he's trying to get to the time control. Yeah. But he, he you know, I, I can feel he was worried about bishop e3, and I don't know that it's best Ooh. to put the knight on the outpost, you know. I takes g4. The counterplay, right? I suggest here he comes. h3. See, see, this is where I lose this, you know. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is where. And now, it's, okay, it's gonna. It's just one pawn. If he takes an on, on a eight, obviously it's the exchange. But I think Faruja is banking on, on the pin after knight a eight, queen a eight. Yeah. White still has to figure out which knight to attack with the queen as you run away. Yeah. Yeah. Really tough choice. Queen b five versus queen e two. I don't know how I would do it. Wasn't queen b five just a massive blunder? Why? Knight a eight is played. Oh, queen a seven defends that knight, huh? Yeah. Good thing I was gonna play queen e two to overprotect e three and h two. I think queen e two is. <laughs> queen e two, knight h two. Oh, queen e two oh, has been played. Queen e two has been played, and against knight h two, queen takes h two would have hit the bishop on h six. So black couldn't go desperadoing for one more greedy pawn yeah exactly you saw it yourself good job <coughs> so queen a7 happened queen g4 good lord okay yeah, but does fruja have anything here i don't see it no this is like he would resign almost bangs out bishop g7 bishop g7 ah, yeah okay it's just i think he's just playing Playing on the clock. One of these two players is about to have their worst back-to-back -back games of their career. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. Brutal. Um, let's let's check on other people because there's so much cool stuff going on. So, uh, yeah. Prague tries to checkmate the bishop on c8. A boss of tries to find some space. The rook could help the bishop maybe move to d7 or b7 at some point, and the queen doesn't have to babysit it anymore. Rook takes d4, plunk in the center. Hey, look, the queen is covering b1. She's amazing on e4, Kostya. Mm-hmm. Some kind of genius level queen. G4 coming in. Ho ho! Well, that explains that move. Two can play at this. Um uh, in case we didn't explain it at all, folks, the point is queen takes g4, bishop takes c5, and basically white's losing material. Mm -hmm. Can't take back on c5, you're kind of routed. So g4, no, and g4 is the live position he's thinking here. When the knight moves, he's going to open up, you know, h2 and e5 squares for this bishop. Maybe he's going to... Nope. <laughs> nope. It's a, this is a very odd position, I have to say. Um, like, my instinct is to, is to like white. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure.
because like brick e7 is coming and then two bishops an uh, open position mm -hmm. knight g5 is a mess we don't know for sure if hikaru's game is is drawn no like there's a pretty high chance that they that these two grind it out we'll see were any moves played over here knight b6 queen b6 bishop c3 queen b5 looking for that end game with pawns on on a nice pawn on b4 to attack for Hikaru. So I feel like Hikaru is slightly pressing already. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, black. Must, I would definitely take black. Yeah, black must be better by now. But it, it might just be um, how they say a symbolic advantage. Mm -hmm. Black looks better, but yeah, maybe not actually better. Maybe so. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be just a draw, as anybody was, as somebody was wondering. I think it's definitely going to be, definitely going to be played for a while. Definitely an advantage for Ikaro. And it's just a technical game that we could definitely get into. But these other games are pretty, well, this game's pretty over. But the, the Prague game is very, very interesting here. And he's gone from knight g5. Mm. So idea is to maybe play f6. Six, for sure. Although yeah. f six g six, what would it do? I don't know. Hmm. Well, f six g six, I I don't know. Maybe you have some sacrificial ideas somewhere. Some knight e sixes of the world. Uh, gritty pants. We talked about this in our um, podcast about you know about this tournament like who we expected to do well in this tournament and so forth and i think all three of us agreed if i'm not mistaken that anybody who managed to win this 14 round candidates tournament would look like a favorite mm -hmm. against ding right now nope even abasov i mean it's hard mm -hmm. to imagine how abasov would come into this tournament and win the whole tournament it would be maybe the most shocking result in chess history coast yeah Yes, it would. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything like that. But it would—I mean, it would place him squarely as the favorite against Ding. I think. Is anyone who made it into the tournament a favorite against Ding? I think Abbasov would have to prove something more than his um, than his. What's that knockout tournament called? World Cup? I think he'd have to do more than his World Cup performance to make us think that he's a favorite against Ding. Yeah. Bishop H2 check is certainly possible, Michal. It's one of one of his moves here. They're at move 27 for anybody wondering about their clock situation. So 13 moves to make. It's mild time pressure for... Prague, but nothing like Vidit's situation. Okay, I understand, Noah. Well, we'll try to we'll try to look at some end games today. Jesse's definitely noticed a huge pattern in the annotated games in the dojo that players who don't have any skill with the end game or much experience with it they basically stop annotating their games when they get to the end game and just sort of eh, whatever happened happened from here <laughs> um, in the old days people often used to do that too right Costa? like even masters would be annotating a game capablanca versus somebody get to the end game and they'd say and the rest is a matter of technique meaning they didn't really know the ins and outs of of this of the final phase yeah, Boss is yeah. playing fine. He's giving a really good fight to Prague today. Has there ever been a world champion defending the title who's been considered even close to as vulnerable as Ding? Yeah, I would say in 2013, when Vichy was the incumbent, um, people were expecting Magnus to win the Canvas tournament and then crush Vichy. People were expecting... Uh, Aronian to possibly win the Canada's tournament, and then he would crush Vichy. And um, people, I think, at that point were also feeling like Kramnik would be a favorite against Vichy because Kramnik had huge chances in that tournament. 
to uh, to win and qualify as well. Which is surprising given that Vichy already won a match against Kramnik. Yeah. Um, but that that was just kind of the state of Vichy's chess at that point. People didn't really like what he was showing. But I think not quite to this degree. So it's an example of Magnus was considered a favorite against him. But Ding has had a much tougher year than Vichy had. Yeah. Yeah, Ding Ding looks like uh, he is having serious psychological issues. Yeah, and chess is a very mental game, so it's really <laughs> hard to believe in Ding until he starts showing something else. Yeah. Yeah, I think Max Ulva in the rematch against Aljechin was probably considered an underdog, um, maybe. Maybe some other examples. I mean, I think Petrosian was not considered a favorite in his world championship match because he rarely won tournaments. He wasn't one of the highest rated players in the world as world champion. It's an example of a world champion who wasn't number one. But yeah, I, I do think Ding is, um, yeah. Definitely looking like one of the most vulnerable champs. How far down the list you could go if people not in the tournament to find someone favored over Ding? Yeah, it's it's hard to say. But I mean, I would favor Abdusadarov or Aragaisi against him. So at least two people who are not in this tournament. <laughs> and then, I don't know, it's not so clear. I mean, at this point, I would favor any motivated 2,700 player. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I might agree. Um, all right, let's 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 do some nuts and bolts on the positions, folks. That's, that's drifting into Dojo Talks territory for sure. So let me check over on some of these games we saw earlier. I'm going to go to Tan Zhang Yi against Anna Muzichuk. Unless Kosti wants to direct me elsewhere. No, where are you going to go? So, um, after the tempo with bishop c3, saving her pieces, Tan went into action with f4, which could be seen to try and pry open g5 with fg5, or it might be breaking the fourth rank pin to just play knight e6 and get it all over with. Like if black. Looks Quite strong. If black plays h6, knight e6. F5 could be the idea too. Yeah, just, like just passing blasting. by. Anna counterattacks the bishop on c3 and does nothing to defend any part of the king side. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Not going well for black at this point. Tan surprisingly doesn't sack a piece. I guess queen c3 and then queen takes d4 was going to centralize for, for Muzichuk. Knight c5. You might want to play bishop h7 before black takes that piece, but she just plays Kostya's move f5. Ouch. Do you think she could have answered knight d3 with f6? Here? Mm-hmm. Folks think Ali Reza really? is still fighting? Well, we may check on them in a bit, but this position's interesting too, folks. F6 looks like uh, game over. Yeah, crispy critters and all that. So f5, so Muzicic felt obliged to trade, which was another way for Tan to keep the angry bishop. Oof. This is when the queen had to go back to d8 again. Maybe not as many times as Ferruja's queen went back to d8, but the position is equally grim. This uh, bishop on e7 is holding a lot of weight for black. <laughs> <laughs> Single-handedly <laughs> holding black position together. Yeah. Yeah, you could see it asking its teammates, like, is anyone else going <laughs> to do anything? <laughs> H6. I like. Oof. I like. I would say this position's a matter of taste because it's probably 23 ways to checkmate. Bishop C8, the French bishop, comes to life. And that's the live position. 
Muzitric has six minutes to get to move 40, but she does have the increment, right, Kostya? Yes. So you got, got increment in a couple minutes. I mean, if she made it to move 40, it would already be an accomplishment. Okay, first thought here would be queen h5 mm -hmm. to unpin and hopefully threaten something like bishop h7 and rook f7. Bishop h7 and rook f7, right. And then if black trades on f5, you're happy to bring the knight or the rook in. Yeah. No, this was a French. That explains why black is lost. <laughs> Coast... See, even random 1200 ELO guy gets it. Grandmaster <laughs> Jesse, he's, he needs some help. <laughs> yeah. Ghost, yeah, how about this move? Bishop takes c8. Queen takes mm -hmm. c8, knight f5. Oh. Rook takes okay. queen. Let's go to the end game. Rook knight G4. takes bishop. King h8. Mm -hmm. What endgame? Welcome to the dojo! <laughs> <laughs> okay, d4. <laughs> uh, he's gonna fight on. No, that, that's actually very nice. Cause yeah. then you take, you take on f7. No, yeah. no, that's that's lights out. I'm coming in. That's nice. I wish I could end the game with rook f4 here or something, but. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's 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 why I wanted to play yeah. Bishop takes C eight. See, it is an end game. It's the end of the game. <laughs> I gotta say, I really like this this peanut gallery looking down on Ferugia. It's just very like, just very poetic. You're just watching the gladiators get slaughtered. <laughs> There's a lot of slaughter. This tournament's very violent. Very violent. Brutal. Yeah. Absolutely bloody. Yeah. <laughs> My apologies for those of you with neighbors. Or headphones. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> Let's see how Lay's doing as I make the rounds. Knight c5. Knight d4. Is this what you want, folks? Is this what you want? All right. So Humpy has a very piano advantage here, right? A small positional advantage, but uh, Lay is probably not losing, right, Kosti? Mm, looks playable. Mm hmm. Man on d4, bishop on g7. Yeah, then Smearin I would be satisfied with the position. Cool. Yeah. So Leia survived a bit, and the clock looks good for her. Humpy's got seven minutes there at move 24. That's a lot of moves to make. They've got the 30 second increment. Um, looking forward to seeing some blood somewhere here. That's where a King's Indian player can strike, right? White gets low on time. You've got some active pieces. Let's check on Ferugia. People said he was still fighting. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it's like the Knight of the Bridge or, or something better than that. Queen c7, Queen b5. By still fighting, I think they just meant he kept queens on the board for one more move. Yeah, the clock is still going. Rook f4 was played. I don't know why there's a variation in my computer saying rook f4, queen d3, but queen e2 was played. They're at move 32, so that it's got eight moves to make in nine minutes and 41 seconds with no increment. Plenty of time. Yeah, he's doing okay here. Is there check in bishop h6? 
I E yes. Hang on. <laughs> well, man on D seven is hanging as well. Yeah, but that those rooks are lined up and undefended. Oh, I think the idea is just rook d four. Bishop, bishop d two, rook d two, and there's no <laughs> there's no way to defend the knight, right? Well, knight can move away, but you're saying d seven. Yeah, I'm saying it can move away, but it's going to want to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still looks like critters. Yikes. That was a really good alertness bouncing across. And it shows how much they're they're calculating even in time trouble, right? Because most likely that it kind of saw this and this is a non trivial thing to find when you're blitzing along, so mm -hmm. And it's instructive, you know, people usually try to win without tactics when they're way ahead, but it's often very hard to do. So you need to keep your tactical brain alive. Yeah. Very important. Lumbra, thank you for the gifted sub. Okay, Queen e5 played. It's a nice Ooh. little threat. Checkmate and the rook. Yeah. Vidit has been known to blunder main and one. That's not a joke. Like, he did it a couple times. The queen on e5 but... is stopping d7. That was clever. This one he figured out. Mm. And knight f6. Jerusha with the pin. Don't touch that deep arm, did it? Papa. Papa, Papa, come here. Shh, 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 shh. All right, guys, we're gonna get another guest on the stream. Known as Papa. See what he has to think about that its position. Hey, sorry about that. Oh, I thought we were gonna get a guest. I, uh, yeah, I had to. I had to. Sometimes she just barks a lot and wakes up the baby, and then the baby wakes up everybody else. It's a bad thing. The new guest has a 2700 cute rating, but not much to say about chess. Oh. I was gonna say, wow, you, even the dog would be a favorite against Ding. Coast <laughs> <laughs> just letting loose a little bit today. You said humor is legal again on, on Twitch. I did, yeah. Let's see, he's come up knight of six, okay. Seven minutes for bid it. Okay, I'm starting to think I would win this position. Mm. Even me against Arusha. Starting to get the feeling. It's good. But it's thinking. But it don't overthink things. It's not becoming. So what would you suggest here? Maybe like Queen C five? Um That was definitely a thought. C three also logical. The knight's hanging for a moment, but it, you know, if, if you block the angry bishop on g7, you could also just be prepared to sack and exchange whenever the bishop comes out and just say we're winning off the d-pawn. Um, I like queen moves. Moves that threaten d7, I guess, are my main moves. Mm -hmm. So queen c5, what, think about knight d5? Mm -hmm. Which may not threaten anything, in which case I would play d7. Yeah, threatening queen takes f8. Mm -hmm. 
Something that it's not liking, though. Mm -hmm. He's thinking. He still has to make seven moves. Yeah. Queen e7 with the idea of knight d5, rook takes knight is also winning. Just mm -hmm. lights out. If knight d5, I mean, there may be other moves. He plays queen c7, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, queen c5. Simple kind of move, knight d5 gets played. So here we're looking at either rook takes d5 or d7. <laughs> there is a good question for you in chat. The screaming, yeah. welcome to the dojo, not wake up the baby. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, used to it, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's white noise to my baby. Okay, 95 played. Even when I'm not streaming, I've got Jesse on in the background. My baby's first oh. words are always, I love dad. All my babies. <laughs> Chat brings up a good point. Yeah, we got to watch out the, for the rook takes d5 moves in our rook analysis. Rook takes d5 is mate. Oh, yeah, I was going to play that move. Aye, aye, aye. I was going to play that in every line. Vitigo's king a2. That doesn't fix the mate, but it at least improves the kink. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to have to stop talking about babies and dogs and get down to some leg day. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about trying to play the move c4 as well Kostya since that knight seems well placed mm -hmm. you know rook takes d5 is a crude tool it also didn't work but c4 a threat right now yeah I thought about c4 and I thought maybe black would have to give a queen check but I wasn't sure about it like what would have happened if c4 had been played already I guess Queen e1, you're thinking rook d1, mm -hmm. and then like bishop takes d4. Even that looks nice for white. So there, if we go queen takes d4, defending the rook, black has to somehow hit the knight with the queen or lose, right? But the pawn's covering this. It looks like a knockout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Then the other move that we'd suggested here, the one that didn't allow mate in one, was d7. And Lowell's asking about that, saying, you know, well, queen f8. And there, the move for black would be rook d8. Mm -hmm. um, d7 also looks good. What also looks good? Just what we have on the board, d7. d7. This also looks good. So rook d8 for black. And now you could play something like queen c8. You could try c4 again. Um, could not do my original rook takes d7 plan. d7. <laughs> I was trying to say it. <laughs> I didn't get it till you wrote it out, Coast. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good one that someone can't even tell when you're doing it, right? <laughs> oh, but that's sneaky in a certain way, right? Like no one will ever know when you're saying D7 on stream. Right. They'll never know. They'll be scared to put their pieces on D7 against you when they play you in Title Tuesday. Yeah, as you know, I'm looking at that square. Yeah. He'd be like, oh shoot, if I play this move, he'll be like, knight d7, d7. Oh. <laughs> oh, better go c3. King a2, get c3, that's useful. Maybe we should go to Prague. I feel like this is, uh, this is just not much for, for black here. Just dirty. All right, Especially Prague. After c3, now he can't even blunder Bishop mate anymore. Bishop h2, which was 10 minutes of thought for Nijot. King G2. Queen E5. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. 
queen f4 was less good with a rook on d4. Rook d5, covering the f5 pawn. Nice. Nice. Very precise. And leaving the bishop on h2 to pay a tempo at some point. You got to pay the troll toll here with the bishop on h2. And it goes all the way back to b8. You got to pay the troll toll. And Prague is still got this bishop on c8 looking not so good. How does David know this reference? You got to pay the troll toll. What reference? Well, you just said. Yeah, when, when you're trolling and the other person has to retreat their piece and lose a tempo. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what do you think, host? The material is equal. The position is so weird, it's hard to even count it. Mm-hmm. Um... I feel like I like white. Yeah. I feel like black's bishops are really struggling to play, and maybe Prague could go rook bd1 and rook d8. Is that too weird? Oh, yeah. White, white's good. D8? White's good. <laughs> white's coordinated. That's the difference between white and black. That's it, right? Yeah, the... And bishops just feel a little, a little boxed in. Yeah. I had an idea a long time ago, Kosti, when g4 was played, that I wanted to go rook b to d1. Um, and then how did it go? Yeah, Black's bishops just look like little oh, yeah. baby boys, huh? Yeah, this was this was the trick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this was why this move was controversial because a bishop takes knight. For a second, I was like, "Why was this a big deal?" The move looked killer. Okay, it was because bishop <laughs> takes c five, pawn takes pawn mm -hmm. takes knight. That's the controversy, right? And then or controversy, and then <laughs> rook to d eight. But when I was looking at this long ago, I couldn't beat the move queen c seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see the answer either. Right. Oh, maybe rook f8 and queen h4. Queen h4. Weird queen h4, huh? I didn't see that at the time, but once I set it up on the board. Hmm. But uh, f6. Hmm. It's like there's no clear clear wind. Mm. Or I mean, what might be down a piece? I mean, rookie one looks quite a bit like a clear win. Rookie one, but uh... wait, what do you play against queen d8? I h8. I mean, king f7, and then rook to oh, Fruiter resigns. Rook to d8. It's over. Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? And he did it with Vidit rook takes d5. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Go Vidit. Beautiful. Beautiful. The safety first oh approach God. did it. He he was normally safety first doesn't win, Kostya, right? Like you were saying, you have to be willing to calculate. But he had such an overwhelming advantage, he just punished that thing. Yeah, it was it was just way too winning. I just saw him on the camera, and he mouthed to, to Ferruja. There's no sound, but I saw him mouth, welcome to the dojo. What? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm no lip reader, but I'm 99% sure that's what he said. That's huge for us, Kostya. That is huge. That is huge for us. He used to be totally into meditation, and you think now he's going to move into trash talking? Yeah. It's like, who told him to say that? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. We should give him a shirt for that. We should send him a shirt. Send yeah. him a shirt. Go bid it. Yeah. <laughs> Rohi, which IM are you talking about? 
Is there an I am in chat we don't know? Oof, that was that was brutal. Okay. Go see this Rook D1 thing. My joke variation, my trash variation is not so obvious. Not so obviously bad. Oh, Rook D8. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. Like, there's a pretty good chance that White would have just won this line. And even like Queen E7 or Queen E5, which look like, ooh, counterplay and we're paying attention for Black, there's just Queen H5 and Mate. Mm-hmm. So, no, no, this looks good. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So uh, Rook D1 was interesting. But anyway, then the reason I bring it up is not to dwell on my weird ideas, but to come to the present, I'm thinking of, you know, Rook BD1 and Rook D8 again, kind of thinking like it allows us to attack those dubious bishops, right? And maybe trying to win one of them at some point. Yeah. Okay, so um, f6 is what uh, Prague played here, which is a little bit of a surprise to me. I really thought just rook to the open file. Regardless of what the follow-up was, it felt like that was coming. Mm -hmm. But f6, I can understand. It just gives Black's king like these long-term problems. Mm -hmm. It feels like he should take that pawn rather than suffering it, right? Ooh. Who would pawns Maybe. on f6 bear? Hmm? Who would pawns on f6 bear? It's Shakespeare. Oh. But that the thought of some, you know, it's from uh, to be or not to be. I see. That's you know. good. So he's saying, like, you'd rather just, you know, have some bodies, do some chopping. You can't just sit around carrying pawns on f6 mm -hmm. that was clever <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the pawn is like the death knell if it's left there right like once white goes rook g5 let's say and then you have to play g6 and then white just just works it mm -hmm. So, but so, I, well, let's just check. Maybe there's some disaster if we take it, right? So that's why I want to look at that first. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say nine of six. Yeah. King g7. The rooks and bishops of outrageous fortune, exactly. Uh, king. G4. King g7, knight takes g4. One coconut. And just, yeah, claim that white's, white's better. Whites up a coconut. Mm, that was awesome understanding you gained, Nipun. And thanks for sharing with us. I feel like we all understand chess really, really well now. Well, we understand that it's the top engine move. So that's something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I would ever find that move in a game yet. Okay. So somebody says, maybe knight c e4 instead of coconut taking Kostya. Look at that classy move from Great Wolf. That could be very strong. That could be better yes. than, a, than a coconut. Mm-hmm. That's like the lime in the coconut. Sorry, Tim. The idea was knight g4, bishop g4, rook g5 check, winning back the elephant in the room. Yeah, but I like that knight c4 playing. The knight c4 looks like uh, looks very much like me. mate. I was looking at rook d8 yes, for a little while to try and make an escape square. Finally, found rook takes rook in response, <laughs> cutting off the f8 square. So. Well, let's check with the engine to understand rook d8. Rook takes d8. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's good. Did it Got confirm? It. Mm -hmm. Is it plus seven or plus nine? Someone on um, Twitter responded to you know the clip we posted when we went crazy over knight takes f7, mm -hmm. and he was like, you know, not everyone is a GM and I am to understand why this is such a wow moment. Yeah, and you said uh, and something so my... like, "Peace f7 boom" or something. <laughs> yeah, my response was "Horsey goes boom on f7." <laughs> Horsey so, yeah. boom f7. <laughs> 
exciting. Okay, so we could go here to not get rook g5, but then rook h1, king here, knight e4, and the same thing happens, but white's rook's already on h1. Yeah, this looks like uh, it mate. It's yeah. Polgar. Holy moly. So what's he supposed to do after f6, Coast? Yeah, Coast. Ooh, cry is back. Yes. Um... Well, we were thinking g6, right? Or I thought I, I was. Cry is back. You're thinking g6. Oh, what a sad move. That's the move of death. The rook d8 plan got a lot better now, too, with the pawn on f6. Rook, rook bd1. <laughs> yeah. Ah, it's not fun for black's bishops. Nope. No bueno in the cabeno. All right, let's bring Jesse in to annotate this moment. And he's getting a drink. Oh, he's back. Oh, yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. Hey, boss. Ooh, dude, Ferruja lost again. Oh. Dang. Dang, the golden boy, dude. I told him, about, I was thinking about him too. I was like, too much for that Parisian. It's like the degeneration of fashion and all that other stuff, dude. Those Frenchies, dude, they will corrupt you. Mm-hmm. Yep. David, can I ask you a question, boss? Yeah. Now that you're there, have you had any frogs or um, snails? I see some snails on my walk sometimes. Have you thought about eating them yet? Nope. <laughs> Isn't that a thing, though, man? Isn't that part of the being French? Little snails here and there? If, I don't know if it's, like, a necessary part. I've tried escargot. It's pretty good. Escargot. That's like David in, in well, however he said it inexorably. I don't know how he said it, man. It was too weird for me to even it. <laughs> escargot. Yeah. Ooh, Bishop F4 from Abbasa. All right, cry. So give me. So that was obviously amazing. Um, that night on e five, I was talking about. I predicted it a mile away, but it didn't save him, did it? Mm mm mm. No. No. Uh, it was it was pretty thorough that game, right? One sided. I'm catching up some moves over here on our technical board. Gukesh. Fully, fully in assumed the position here against Naka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put it on the dark squares, babe. Yeah. Well, let's say the obvious. There's only one person playing for a win here. Yeah, we yeah. we said that one thing already. Really <laughs> showing. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's as far as we could go. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he, Naka could have made a draw by now, but clearly he's been, he's been testing the waters. So good mm -hmm. for him. Um, all right, I'm going to go on a little rant about chess.com. All right, so I'm out there with the kids, right? And mm -hmm. I'm on the phone, and I'm, you know, at the park, and I want to see what's going on. So I turn on El Fono, and there's, on the, the, the phone, there might be, it's just literally like, the first thing you see is the eval, you know? And so it was like with the Vidit game, uh, it was just like boom, all the way to the top. And I was like, dude, and I looked at the position. I was like, well, would I really think it was all the way to the top? I wouldn't know for sure, you know, especially Ooh. the first position I saw. And um, I was like, what a drag, man. What a total drag that they do this. It's like they're force feeding you or something, you know? And it's not just chess.com. You know, I, I went on a break and I checked uh, Twitter and it's just mm -hmm. screenshots every single stream. Mm -hmm. Vidit Farouge. And then the bar is just like plus eight or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a whole thing, you know? You just can't escape it. Good God. Did you guys see the moves that Tan played this game? Ooh. Somehow she's down a piece, but... 
She played a lot of cool looking moves. Does queen f7 win the game? That would be a crazy final move. Queen f7. F7 looks gorgeous. Going to the end game down a pawn. I mean down a piece. Jeez, Louise. Beautiful. She gave everything, Kosti. Everything. Yeah, it was a very nice game. Yeah, it's gotta be it's gotta be my gotta put that game in the recap. Yeah. Plus she's like winning the tournament so far. Mm-hmm. How's uh Griachkina doing? Um let me see. Ryachkina is up a pawn. Oh, I'm on the wrong I'm on the wrong bracket here. Switch over. Mm, to me that looks like very nice winning chances for black. Vaishalu lost today with white to Lano. And here's Goryachkina. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Outside pass pawn. Mm, yeah. Very high chance. Well, I'm looking at this Prague game, dude. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you, man. I mean, I guess I want to be white, but, you know, you got to make sure those bishops are under control. Yeah. Uh, he's been keeping the bishop on c8 on a pretty good leash so far. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, rook d1. This was my pedestrian move, Jesse. I wanted to play rook d1, and uh, Prague played f6 first. Mm-hmm. That was that was the difference between him and me. And now rook d1. And you know, the general idea is to go rook d eight and win that bishop on c eight where it stands. Oof. Oof. Hmm. With the bishop covering rook g five, can black take on f six now? There's a problem, though, with the bishop on f4, you can't go king g7 because of knight h5. Exactly, right. So that is just no bueno, you no lo puedo. So white, white would just rook h1. I'll just put it on the board. Yeah. Um, so basically first, you know, the king can't go here because you drop your bishop. <clears throat> and if the king goes here, rook h1, yeah, it just forces you to go drop the bishop to that knight attack. Mm, there's, this is a very uncomfortable position. If if Black's okay, he has to find some. Actually, it's interesting. We have we, yeah. If we were doing the eval bar here, we would just be like, it's either toast or it's like, well, he's obviously got to play that. But looking at it, it's like I don't know what Black's supposed to do. Like maybe you sacrifice your position with Bishop e6, mm -hmm. but that's gonna be that's for sure suffering. Yeah. You mean Bishop e6, and then White would take it. Or white well, actually, it. it's, you're, white's got a choice there. But definitely taking it, white has the advantage. Because mm -hmm. um, you could follow it up with rook d8. Or you ignore it and play rook d8. That might even be worse. Okay, rook c7 play. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question, Purus. What does f6 do here? I mean, one thing it does is it, it's cramping the black king. There's a lot more checkmates mm -hmm. with that pawn on f6. And it turned out black couldn't take the pawn for tactical reasons that were also checkmates. Um, so it's yeah. a really good question though, because I think most chump GMs would that would not be their first instinct, because it would be like, well, what am I actually trying to do? Right. You know. Yeah, this move was on a level, man. Well, and it comes with the next question. Rook c seven kind of just tells white like well what is it mm. so it protects the bishop so it defangs rook d8 a little bit mm -hmm. so i'm assuming on rook d8 he can the bare minimum he can snip and play king h7 mm -hmm. so white definitely needs an idea here yeah i think maybe knight d3 could run the bishop out of squares since the rook got in its way and black's pieces don't have a lot of options in general this game 
Okay. Well, at the very minimum, the 4C movie's got to play Bishop H6, right? Mm -hmm. But we need a we need a follow up, I guess, after that. How about um, FG7, King G7, HG3? Kosuke sees a fork and is determined to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possible. Well, also my thinking is if we trade off one bishop or knight, either bishop or either knight, it's like that looks nice for white. Mm -hmm. Especially like bishop g3, king g3 or whatever. But wouldn't black play like king g6? Well, at least that would be my question. What about king g6? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was just hoping open for some some coconuts here mm -hmm. i've infected you guys with the coconuts dude everyone yeah. is it's been all day jesse it's coconuts <laughs> this crispy critters that i mean the whole dojo is, yeah. is diseased with your vernacular yeah there's no cure <laughs> when well, i heard fact, you coast say boss one day i was like oh man that's now it's bad now it's real bad i had to wean myself off <laughs> to go cold turkey on the boss <laughs> i would feel kind of nervous as white here because i'd be like well i gotta do something or else the bishops are going to end up murdering me mm -hmm. i wouldn't really be afraid of black murdering me here i'd be pretty confident that i had the upper hand but you still need to do something. Mm -hmm. Rook hmm. one D four. And what's the intention? Move the knight somewhere. Okay, maybe. Mm -hmm. Also, people are just in like Rook H one, Rook H five ideas, which mm -hmm. does not does not seem so so bad to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also thinking about Rook H one, but oddly, I mean, we could have played it last move. So true. Ooh, I think this one's hard. Let's see. Prague's on move 32. So he's got eight moves to make and seven and a half minutes to make them. Mm -hmm. mm. Also, the post game with Prague and uh, Nepo was really interesting yesterday. And what was funny is Prague saw Queen E5, dude. Mm -hmm. And for us, and I think everybody else, I think the, the way the, the questioner was framing it, it sounded like that's what the computer wanted to. The computer had some other crazy ideas as well. But um, it's one of the things that was really weird is like he, because he couldn't see an absolutely clear path, um, he was just like, no, I can't do it. And I was like, Bows. You go down that path. There's riches down there. And, you know, weird, weird. I honestly, I think like maybe a sign of a younger player because he wants to calculate everything out. And the positions we were looking at where the king was just exposed for like Fabi or somebody to be like, yes, please, let's go with that. Heavy end game with the with the uh, king exposed. Rook 1d4, Kostya. Mm -hmm. You're a genius. You're a genius, buddy. Oh, let's go Prague. Kostya, you just got one of the hardest moves of the day. Now, so that's a GM the... norm, right? That's one. <laughs> one of the questions I had about that move was like, what about bishop c1? Hmm. Yeah, Prague, what about bishop c1? Okay, but I, let's ask ourselves, is it 
actually an idea. So let's say it's white smooth. Is there, it, we're going to claim knight g3 is a threat, I guess? I'm also just I'm chasing sure down is. the bishop with rook c4, right? No? After bishop c1, you play rook c4? Maybe. Bishop takes a3? Ooh la la. Mm. Take. Wait. Wait, is rook g5 then? Yeah, but I'm taking first, right? Mm. Now, the thing about this bishop is. I'm assuming dude has to go like bishop c1 or bishop h6. So if it goes like bishop c1 and you tag me rook c4, mm -hmm. if I don't want to take bishop a3, I can go bishop h6. You could go back, too. yeah. That's fair. And then I've discorded my, my rooks for what? For what, yeah. Okay, so we're on rook d4, and Jesse asks this question bishop moving away the same guy julian who estrada nieto who taught me about the coconuts mm -hmm. told me that the rooks in the center were big shit. that's what he said <laughs> i hear they're definitely in the center you know oh yeah they're they're all over the center That's so funny. Uh, I heard Ooh. this story about um, Leonard Cohen, famous mm -hmm. musician, and that his first guitar was gifted to him by this uh, Spanish musician who then taught him, you know, a series of chords that would then lay the foundation for a lot of Cohen's earlier music. And so I feel like the foundation of a lot of Jesse's sayings come from this one <laughs> yeah. Spanish international master. <laughs> So I found a knockout against rook c1, folks. You go rook d8, like before, right? You're threatening rook f8 and rook d8 mate. Okay. So previously against rook d8, like last move with the bishop on f4, black was going to trade and slip out at h7, right? Yeah. Now without the bishop on f4, I trapped the other bishop on c8 with knight d6. That's done. Mm. Nowhere yeah, that looks like game. Right, something like this. We take, and then we push. Ah, uh, okay, boss. Okay. Um, Lumber's asking what we think is the best game until now. For me, first game that comes to mind was Nepo Ferruja. I just felt like that was an incredibly well-played game from Nepo. Are you kidding me, dude? It's not even a contest. It was Prague beating... Um... Vid it, dude. Are you kidding me? What a, a game. game. That was a good game. That was a good game, he says complacently. <laughs> <laughs> that was like coconuts of steel, bro. Yeah, I was going to. There were there were several great games here. Mm, this move putting putting a lot of pressure on black dude. So bishop h6 allows a similar thing, right? Of rook d8. Mm -hmm. So and king h7, which you would try to maybe get out of dodge, mm -hmm. allows knight g5. Right here, knight g5 check. Yeah, exactly, and that's got to be a nice position, I think. Why is that so good? Well, you have to give me your coconut. Yeah. Okay, coconut. Oh, yeah. maybe. Okay, no, you're right. Maybe it's not so special. Good question. Good call. So king h7, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, you too, good riddance. Hmm. Yeah, we don't have to go there, but I can tell you that the uh, Naka game is just really Tausch machining right here. Oh, yeah? That's good mm. news. <laughs> is it good news? Yeah. Why is it good news? Um, so that Gukesh doesn't lose, since oh, he was yeah. slightly worse. We got our Gukesh fanboy over here. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. We got to crush this king h7 move. It's a good move. It's a good move. And the king. Mm. The king David, queen. another very basic thing we can do on king h7 mm -hmm. is just play knight d6. Yeah. That's what I was we trying touch to look the at. Bishop. We touch the bishop and we're just saying, hey, boss, I'm going to win the pawn on a6. Yeah. And, and like Kostya said, we want to get rid of one of his bishops. Yeah, and the dark square bishop is the better of them. Mm -hmm. If we had a choice. I mean, we're well set up with the knight on c5 to play against the light squared bishop. So. Um, this does allow bishop d6 and a5, which maybe is not a big deal. <clears throat> right. Mm-hmm. And I would say white's a little bit better there, but but yeah, that was that's the thing we would have to like feel good about. Yeah, we haven't finished the game yet, but I think the next step would be to improve our king. You know, if black trades on b4, trade. they trade on b4. You know, mm -hmm. bishop's still kind of trapped. Rooks are pretty good. So just bring the king up to g3, then maybe put the rook on d4 on d5, so we've got ideas to go attack the king some more. Wait a second. What if we just go full Brutalo mode and like king h7 mm -hmm. and we play knight g3? Okay. So they have to take it. King well, I, I mean, okay. Now, by the way, I can play fg first. I can intermezzo. Yeah. Do you want to? I'm not sure. But um, I'm just saying if I want to be safe, I intermezzo. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's an advantage for white. Yeah, but not bigger than knight d6, this position here. This one's kind of cool because my king is embracing your coconuts. <laughs> but with the rook on d6, we saw that f6 pawn, the black king, was much worse. And now there's no a5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think a5 is like a very big... I didn't want you to play a5. Anyways, there's, this is an option too. Rook c6 was the choice. So I well, found a move... That was better than what we found for him, right? He fights and then he immediately control. goes yeah. as knight d6, though. Yeah. Prague goes into knight d6. And if this all has to trade, then at the end, the a pawn's just dead. Straight up mm -hmm. done. That so this work. one's actually, well, rook c6 is problematic in the, in when the taking variation, you have to trade your rook, which doesn't allow a5 and leaves your a6 pawn just dying. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know about rook c6. Yeah. Prague seems to have played knight d6 pretty quickly, so he's kind of knows what he's doing here. Um, I, playing a great game today, in my opinion, and I actually have a very low opinion of the game he played yesterday, but I think now with what Jesse told me, I see a little bit of like how you could be like close to finding something good, but but the, the, the decision-making process messes you up. But I thought overall his game yesterday was pretty was pretty bad um, in that, you know, he got that good prep, right? So those moves he didn't have to come up with. Mm -hmm. You can give him credit for his homework and all that, right, or his mm -hmm. second or whoever. But given that his prep landed him straight into a winning position, he didn't, you know, he didn't win it. He missed knight b7. Like, it wasn't just that he didn't find what's good with queen e5. He, like, mm -hmm. blundered knight no, b7. No, he saw knight b7. He saw it, dude. That was the thing that came out in the conference. I was like, you saw knight b7. He saw queen e5. And the weirdest thing was it was because he couldn't see a forced win on queen e5. But he has other moves that don't trade queens. And after knight b7, he didn't these... even press the end game at all. Well, he didn't understand. I don't think he's that good at pressing the end game. He played some moves, and I was like, oh, dude. You yeah. know, what are you doing? Right. So I thought overall but, he the, played actually really badly yeah. yesterday, even though the prep was so exciting. It was like once he played, it was meh. For anyone getting mad, I mean, I'm a fan of his. I just thought. Wait a second. On reflection. Can, Black draw. Bishop, can Black play Bishop E6 here? What's going on on Bishop E6, boss? Hmm, good question. I just want to say Naka Gukesh official draw. Oh, dude. Ooh, Bishop 40. E6, isn't that a problem for our coconuts? Hmm. You're giving me the cold sweats with this move. Jesus. That's something a person could miss. I missed. I didn't um, see it. 
Oh, I'm denied. Thank you so much for the bets. How about 96 and F7 check? Is that something? Rook F7? Something that and is something. Knight F7. Then e ED5? And then Rook F4. Oh, maybe. Ooh, Kosya. Maybe. Kosya. Is that the second GM norm? Second GM norm. <laughs> He's blazing through this title. <laughs> Damn, what a line. Wow. You I was inspired by MD Knights. You stunned village. me there, dude. You stunned me. <laughs> yeah, man. I get it. And maybe he saw it too, man. This The kid sees it. The kid does see everything. Like we thought yesterday that he was just missing stuff. No, the kid was not missing stuff. He might be misevaluating stuff, but he wasn't missing it. Good Lord. Good Lord. I can imagine being black and thinking too that that was going to save me. King H7. Yeah, I thought on King H7 there was like a mate or something, but I don't actually know. But it looks like the king can still tag the rook before we can go rook F4. Yeah, I might have messed this up. Oh, I guess there's rook C5 still. Something like this. Um, but without the check. Without the check. Oh, sorry. Hold on to the F pawn. Right, right, right. Sorry, that was... Yeah, that, that should still be nice for white, right? Like rook d6, rook f4, rook d7, rook c6. Mm-hmm. <laughs> complicated not super clear oh that's 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 a hard life for black though yeah it's a crazy thing where white's knight is hanging folks after this bishop e6 and f e6 move but if the rook takes White manages to pick this up. It's so magical that the knight is defended by rook takes f4. Yeah, it's very weird. Normally, this kind of tactic is why my Mexican friend would tell me that the rooks in the center are shit, by the way. Cause they just <laughs> they don't want to be in the center, man. They they have as much influence from the side. Yeah, they look so Most clunky when this bishop here. Are not good. This is why you said they were big shit. Like... <laughs> Yeah, big well, shit, like, bad. very bad. They're very bad. Oh, very I bad. I think Mierda Grande or something like that would be the translated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he went G5. Wow, he's all in on the dark squared bishop. Would not give it up. Prague is, like, in full puzzle rush mode right now. He's, like... This is my chance. Oh, G5. Balls of steels, man. Okay, hey, my first question would be knight D E4. Right, we could just go back. Mm -hmm. Oh sorry. I grabbed the wrong. That could be his default move. No, G5 is it's that's a combative move. I, I wasn't thinking about G5. And now I guess we are threatening Bishop E6. No good move. Knight E4 seems like a fair fair a fair answer. So, but the issue is when you play knight g5, 
You're not threatening knight takes g5 because then I just play rook takes f6. Mm -hmm. He took the bishop. Okay. I'm wondering if... I had a thought here. Well, I think he's going to go after the a-pawn now with rook d8. Yeah, rook fc8. There he goes. This is... um. This is just going to be a good old-fashioned race, my friend, much like a Bossoff's race yes, yesterday. And my sensei, Smitsloff, said that the bishop was better than the knight when it came to pass pawns running on both sides. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, it looks, does not look especially good for white to me right now. Like he's releasing the tension. He's trading the trapped pieces, right? The rook on f8, the bishop on c8. But I don't feel like he's achieved so much. Well, right, and we're gonna unless he has some fancy man's idea here, which I don't see yet. Uh, like rook a8, rook f6, rook a6, something like that. Mm -hmm. Who knows what's happening? May, there's arguments for white, by the way. There's arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that your knight's on a light very, square um, and you can just push the b pawn through, right? Yeah, no, I had I had a really similar endgame not too long ago with this kind of almost exact configuration. I had like knight and two pass pawns, a and b, with rook against rook and bishop, and black had some annoying counterplay on the queen, king side, and it was uh, I had no win actually. I wasn't even better. It was very surprising. But this feels like a better version than what I had. So I would think white's ahead here. Well, I guess the the big argument for white is that black's push is limited by the F2 pawn and the embrace that the king V2 is putting on black's past pawns, right? And of course, the black king on H7 is miles away from our coconuts on the queen side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's the outside pass pawn factor. And I'll just tell you, what, what's interesting about this one is there's no way you're calculating this. <laughs> you're just playing this on, you're just like, well, this looks like it should be something. My instinct right. is rook f5, and he does play that extremely quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does have good chess culture. Like, he might be blowing it now and then, but he, like, I like the way, even though he lost that endgame, Yesterday, I liked in principle a lot of the ways he played the end game, like the way he kept the pawn on H, the you know, mm -hmm. the counterplay and yada. Then he just blundered mate, <laughs> he just blundered mate, dude. Oh, or the queen trade, however you want to call it. Yeah, so uh, default move, I think, here. Ooh, I was gonna say rook c6, however, on rook c6, uh, bishop c1, a4, bishop a3 three might touch my coconuts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so dude is going to get more time. This will touch more time at move 40. The king being cut off on the sixth rank is not useless either. That's going to be just like a little grief for black to deal with at some point. It's hard to find a great move here for white. Mm, F5 was a good move. So White's move here. It's the last move of time control, by the way, folks. One more move for both players to get more time. Knight E4 has been suggested by Jake Loans, and it looks perfectly acceptable to me. Knight goes to a decent light square. You know, knight f6 to g4 must be prevented, probably. And it prepares the move a4. Hard to find a different move. Wait, the knight e4? Wait, so what happens if white just starts with a4? A bishop d2. Bishop d2 we don't like. Okay. I don't know if we don't like it, but the idea is, you know, to to go after the knight that's on the dark square here, right? It's got some little issues. Gotcha. And that makes sense. 
Jesse was doing the same thing even deeper against rook c6. He's going to c1, right, and then coming at us from a3. Maybe then you could transfer the knight to a6, Jesse. Oh, I got one, Mr. Proust. Look at this. Rook c6, bishop c1, mm -hmm. knight e3, bishop a3, rook c3. Welcome to the dojo. Knight yeah. e3, bishop a3, rook c3. Yeah. Dem critters crisped. I would want, if, if, if I saw that, then I would definitely want rook c6. Because rook c6 is like, the that's the one, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the one. I want to start pushing my stuff. You sure you win this after bishop b4, knight b4? All I know is I'm I'm happy there. You're happy. Do I win it? I, I don't know, but I'm just a just a happy camper. Mm -hmm. I think, I'm going to say yes. I think there's a Dogs fair chance knights. black holds it. He, he went, went for knight d7. Yeah, knight e4, knight d7, similar moves. My thought, Jesse, on rook c6, my updated thought was rook c6, bishop c1, a4, bishop a3, and then knight a6. Very simple, right? We put the knight on the square that we wanted it on with the rook trade. Mm. Their bishop is now god-awful for stopping our pawns, right? And the b-pawns got basically a full red carpet laid out. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think, okay, I'm trying to diagnose this move. Yeah. Now, maybe the idea is simply that I control the queening square. 97, you mean? Right. Played, sure. Now, it's a little weird. I'm anticipating king g7. Yeah. And then I don't really, like, rook d5 is then coming, and then what's the knight going to do? Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think he's going to go to f6, actually, again. Okay, so we could imagine maybe the intention is like king g7, a4, and if rook d5, then knight f6. That makes sense. Looks pretty good. The pawns are, are in motion. No, that's a pretty good move. If I, I don't see anything wrong with it. We've been getting some endgame lessons this tournament, man. Yeah, so also, some like endgame blunders. <laughs> Yesterday saw two massive blunders. Oh, and like hour six of play, dude. You know, exhausted people making blunders. All right, guys. I think I got to run. Get ready for the recap. I'm I'm okay. spelling the end of the round, you know, coming soon. <laughs> it's feeling like. <laughs> so, Ghosty, let me just okay. ask you. Let me ask you two questions before you go, boss. Yeah. So, um, so you have to do the recap, but you kind of have to wait for all the games to finish before you do it, right? Yeah, like yesterday I was waiting for a bit, but, um, you know, what I do is I analyze the games, and so I know what I'm going to say about them. And then, uh, to me, it was pretty clear that Gukesh was going to win that Queen End game, so I just proceeded, you know, as if he was going to win. <laughs> okay. Okay, one more question. So tomorrow, yes. you're going to do this special thing in St. Louis with, like, a live audience, right? That's right. And what time do you start? So tomorrow, I think I'm going to start at the the normal time, probably around 1 uh, or 2.40 Eastern. And then are you going to be doing it on the St. Louis stream and our stream, or how is it going to go? Um, no, it'll just be on Dojo stream uh, as okay. usual, but I'll just be streaming from the, the club. Okay, cool, man. Um, okay, and okay. I should be joined by uh, Nishnik. So Okay, nice. That should be fun. Um, but it won't be the whole time. So they start their broadcast at 5 p.m. Eastern. So I'll basically go until they start their show. And then uh, I'm assuming you guys will be around to, to take over and keep the, the dojo show going. You got that right. All right. And I, I will be doing the, the, the graduate show before that, but it's not too heavy. So you probably don't need to call me. <laughs> you probably don't need to call me on the phone and be like, right, get off. Get off. Dude, I was, I was just thinking about that, but that was so crazy. I mean, call Jesse. I'm like, Jesse, the candidates are starting. He's like, well, who cares about the candidates? Yeah. <laughs> you got the graduate show, There's the man. grad Come show. On. 97 is really growing on me. That's really growing on me. Okay. All righty. I'll see you All guys. Right, bye. All right. See you, coast to coast. We had a question about this end game, Jesse. The question is... Is white holding down upon here? 
This is oh. Nurgil Salimova versus Alexandra Goryachkina. Well, it's definitely fear suffering. One question is like, is can you deal with the Bishop H three threat? That's our, I guess that's the big question. So bishop h3 threat, which is to win the f7 pawn. So the knight of it has got to move. Actually, we got to also say it might not actually be that big of a deal. Let's say, let's say it's white's move, bishop h3, king d6, rook f7. We do have knight e4 then. So even that's not so pleasant for white. Mm, yeah, yeah, breaking, breaking down. Uh, very unpleasant for white. Knight e4 looks playable for black. Are we giving anything up by playing I wouldn't want to do it unless I really had to, though, right? Okay. Okay, True. king g7 was played in our famous game. Okay. And we were anticipating a4 for white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Simple and strong. Mm-hmm. And does, is Naka doing anything against? No. Official draw, Naka Gukesh. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Solid. Solid. Oops. Sorry. Okay. King G7 played over here. Yeah, A4 looks clear. Prague might try to calculate to the end of the game or something. I don't know how he does it. Oh, man. Ferruja, dead last place, man. Yeah. Phew. Yeah, he looked, he looked uh, in trouble today. I love 97, man. That's a beauty. It didn't cross my mind at all. That's a that's just like poetry because you're waiting for the rook to move, and you're just like, well, while you're trying to figure like your life out, I'm gonna play moves like a four, buddy. And whenever uh, it moves, then you go to f six after all, huh? And I was trying to play for black with ideas like g three, f g, bishop e three to try to get some counterplay, mm -hmm. but I was looking at that and I was like, well, nah, I just play g four, you know, and then yeah. it's kind of hard for you to win that pawn. Yes, black, you would need time to play g3, fg, bishop e3, and g4 at once, right? To nail that pawn on g3, box yeah, the king be... with a exactly. light square if I, pawn. If I could do that, then I have a draw with rook f2 and stuff. Mm -hmm. It still might be his best chance, and I assume that's what Prague is like thinking about. He's like, all right, I want to play a4, and then black will do something. What is it? <laughs> Can I figure it out? Whereas a chump GM would just be like, well, A4 looks correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got a suggestion from Chad of rook to A5. And I assume they think that after rook A5, B A5, the bishop on F4 can't get to A7 in time. Which seems correct. He, he played it, dude. He which played it. And King D6 window. was played immediately. Yeah. I was going to say, so the only real question would be king g6, you know, bringing the king towards the situation. Now, if white wants, they could still trade on f5 and start pushing the a pawn, right? Because... But that's a hectic situation because yeah. then the knight uh, is going to get touched with king e6. Right. You go here, king e6, and you can't get there faster than black gets bishop b8 in that case, right? So in that case... You know, after king here, you're going to have to make a knight move, and the king's going to get all the way over. Doesn't seem doesn't seem winning to me. Now, here's a funny thing. If white wants, he just plays rook a6 and says, welcome to the dojo. <laughs> says, like, nice, you found it. Nope. No. <laughs> yeah. It might not be super clear, because maybe you could play f6 and mm -hmm. king f7. I don't know. Oh, this move looks killer, Jesse. A4 in this position, a waiting move. Black's completely Funny. frozen. But wait, he's not frozen. He can play bishop d2. 
Bishop d2. Rook takes f5. King takes. A pawn. Oh, That's the tempo we need. I see what you're doing. Look at that knight stopping bishop c5, bishop b8. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just... Yeah. Good lord. That a4 move, Jesse, that is... Well, a4 is a good looking move. He's got that available right here in this position. It's the knight it's so good looking. He's just played it, Jesse. He's just played yeah. it. That is a stone cold... Oh man, it reminds me of you know the famous thing with like the pawns where the king's stuck on f6 with his own f7 pawn and white's got like the pawns on f5 and h6. Okay, yeah, and I you're just like frozen, yeah. right? It feels like that black is so frozen here. The knight on d7 has been doing so much work. Okay, so now he goes for it with g3. So that's to get the e3 square for the bishop. Let's just calculate rook f5. Does it win right. on the spot? Right. Rook f5 and a5 should win on the spot. Whereas Fe3 might be hectic. Fg3 is probably also winning, but much longer. So, Rook F5. No, we, but we don't want Fg3 because then the bishop can go to E3. I know. So then, this... like Fg3, Bishop D2, and he would live. Well, I think yeah, I think White would still win eventually because they've got two connected passives and Black just sacked a pawn. But this would be the Fair direct enough. win. Right. A5. Black's got no way to bother us with the G pawn. We. I was we're say we we're embracing, don't care about we're embracing that pawn. his pawns, dude. We're embracing them. <laughs> Just going. Even once he takes on f2, we don't have to take him, right? <laughs> Wait, when he takes on f2, if we keep pushing, then he's got bishop e3. No, we've got knight c5. Okay, so we just keep ignoring. Oh, it's so cold, dude. The bishop. <laughs> Knight dominates the bishop bow. There he goes, a5. And the king just sits here embracing. He doesn't even take the thing. He's just comfortable. He's embracing, yeah. We're just embracing. Just, just spoons the pawn. Spoons the pawn. Oh, man. Prague was on fire today, Jesse. I don't know what else yeah. to say. Like This is like a fine, fine game he's played. Well, that's why I put him. I picked him as number three, dude. Dang. And he will be number... Th yeah, he's going to be tied with Fabi after this. Oh, this tied game for third, was... three, four. This game was on quite a level. Oh, my goodness. So, let's see here. Isn't Prague going to be on plus one after this game? Yeah, he's going to be yeah. tied with Fabi. Yeah, somebody in chat just said 3 out of 6. But yeah, 3.5 out of 6. And, you know, playing good, tied with Fabi. And only one plus slash minus slash half point behind uh, Nepo and Gukesh, right? Yeah, that's good. All right, I'm going to read off the, the rounds for tomorrow, but it's Naka against Jan. Dude, Ooh. Oh, that's, that'll be, dude, somebody's got to take that man out. Yeah. Ooh, and then Fabi against Prague. Yeah. Fabi's going to be gunning for tomorrow. Yeah. Basov is going to go Tausch Machina against Vidit. But who gets Feruja? Gukesh does? Feruja gets Gukesh as yes! Black. Gukesh is Black. Mow him down. <laughs> poor Feruja, man. Poor Feruja. When, he's, man. Bleeding, when man. he's bleeding, man. Oh, kick him while he's down. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, man. Serve him up. Dangerous game for Gukesh. No, 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 no. The Indians are doing good, man. Yeah. The Indians are doing great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're they're showing the power. They're showing the power. Claude Tausch is to trade in German. A Tausch machine yeah. is a trading machine. That's, yeah. That's what Jesse's calling anybody who seems to be trying to get draws via straightforward liquidation liquidation and there what it is do I, look like? I look like a merchant to you <laughs> a6 draw merchants dude yeah <laughs> draw merchants oh i gotta tell you my spanish joke dude ready yeah i hope so <laughs> uh... i hope i'm ready <laughs> Um, okay, so if you're at a at a tournament in a Spanish speaking country mm -hmm. and you want to make a uh, draw, yeah, 
you know, then you either make a reference to um, Jesus Christ or to carpentry. Okay. So, <laughs> because in Spain, a draw is tablas, mm -hmm. tables, tables. And of course, Jesus was a carpenter. So you, you, you say you're feeling, feeling like Jesus, you know, you feel like making some tablas. Mm -hmm. there you go, but I, I know you appreciate that because you hate the draw so much. Too. Did Jesus make a lot of tables in his career? <laughs> yeah. The guy was a carpenter, man. Okay. That's cool. So you say, you say, are you a carpintero? Yeah. There you go, bud. That's how you know, too. Then if you, if you I know, if, actually, that's real rough because if David hears you say that, dude, it'll be, he might not know any Spanish, but he'll hear that and he'll be on you. <laughs> he'll be on you, dude. He'll be like, don't you know about my anti draw crusade? You, I got you, man. I got you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. I guess that's it, dude. Prague did it. So two winners today. Vidit did it and Prague did it. And uh Ferugia looking like looking mm. like fresh meat. Looking fresh. like fresh meat. I mean, compared to him, Nijat's putting up a huge fight every round, right? And I mean, no, no, come on. Ferugia has made it interesting every single game. It's yeah. just that he's been cracking every single game. T today's game was not good, Jesse. I think there's a point where, you know, because of expectations, they mm -hmm. may be on the same score, but like Nijot still has everything to play for, right? The and, thing and about being, wearing, being in high fashion is if you wear a bunch of fancy clothes, it's fine if you're winning, but if you're not winning, it just, it does, it looks especially bad, dude. You know what I'm saying? It looks especially bad. I, All those fancy golden glasses he's got worth a $2,000 or whatever it is, give me it. I don't Come even on. I don't even see it, so it doesn't look good or bad to me. It's just yeah passes me by. Uh, <laughs> you know, miss All right, man, I got to go deal with some, so so. Me and you are gonna pick up maybe I I might not be there right away, but around five Eastern is yeah. when he's gonna be done. Yeah, and you just come in when 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 you want. I'll be there. Nice, dude. All right, my man. All right, bye. See ya. All righty, folks. Let's take it home with a couple end games. Humpy versus Lay. We see this A-pawn causing some grief. Uh, Humpy might be on her last legs. I mean, is there a, a, a plan of just bringing the bishop to B2? And how does it get stopped? Yeah. Don't worry, Joseph. I'm not. I'm not stopping here. We're gonna. We're gonna look at these games here. But thanks. Thanks for all the kind comments. As if we were. As if we were done. Appreciate the. Uh, appreciate the friendliness, everybody. This looks like resigns for Humpy. Says Patrick Daly and N1C5. Agreeing. So this King's Indian came to fruition. Yes, this is what lay needed a win. That's what each player needs, right? <laughs> no engine isn't like a, an idea though you know what i mean like no engine is just how it always used to be done and how we've always done it we didn't like start using engines and then get this idea like what have we stopped right this is just what we've always done um but i'm super glad that you're enjoying watching classical it's always been fun to me to watch classical so i'm happy to share that with you um clergy predicted every single game today incredible so we may back up a little bit and see how Humpy lost what was a pretty good position, yeah? I had a feeling that Humpy might be shaky today because, you know, the, this, this game I saw her play against Salomova two days ago. Um, or maybe three because of the rest day, right? But the game before this round, round four. Um, it, uh, we'll get there, Patrick, for sure, in a second. Um, 
that game looked like she was off kilter already. So, all right. So let's we're we're gonna back this up a little bit, and then we're gonna go look at uh, this end game over here. Salimova still looks quite promising for Goryachkina, just without any calculation, just the, the sort of guessing. Bishop a3 just played by Lay here, by the way. So let's just back up a little bit and see if we can figure this out. Um, so we had this position here. You know, it felt like maybe a tiny plus for white. Rook b8 instead of rook c8. Who knows what that's about, really? Fancy little differences. Knight comes back. Yeah, white, white doesn't really ever want to trade this knight because this pawn becomes a better passer and this bishop becomes a better bishop, right? So it's kind of sitting there. We get the rook trade. Interesting little tactic. Lay just surprisingly gives up the outpost on c3, which Humpy probably barely even expected. Counters on these pawns. So takes, takes, queen f6. Now basically what you see is this is a pass pawn and this is an isolated pawn. I mean, technically e5 is also isolated, right? But, um, but this looks like the better pawn here. Oh, and now the white king is weak on dark squares. The black king's weak on light squares. So it's complicated here. White gets the trade. Wow, I don't know if I would consider this that strongly. So white needs to bring the king in a hurry. Tries to solve the problem by trading knights. Absolutely never happening. Oh god. So this feels like a big mistake here. Blocking the bishop. This looks like a horrible move. Maybe, I mean, I'm going kind of superficially because I also want to get to the live position. But it looks like this knight move blocks the bishop and chases black's knight into aggressive action, right? And in theory, what the position kind of wants you to do is to bring your king towards your c-pawn. To hold things together. I mean, the position should be close to equal if white's king were centralized. Abdul also calls king g1 like a normal position, like a normal person move, right? So here, here, here. And then we're dropping the A-pawn. I mean, yeah, we spent two to three moves inviting black to take the A-pawn. Wait, and now she's moving this knight. Can the king not get over in time? Well, obviously, we, we've already identified where white got in trouble, right? Oof, GG. Too many pass pawns now. This knight of five move actually, I mean, it, it's just, it was such a bad move, I think, that on its own, it like weighs the entire white position down, right? Like cement shoes. Um, it's just, there's, there's, there's sort of no coming back from this one mistake, weird. Yeah, it went downhill so fast, Patrick. It was really this one move, completely sunk white. Knight f5. Wasting time, blocking your own bishop. Aye, aye, aye. For anyone not seeing the point of e3, I mean, for one thing, it's threatening to go queen, but also we're trying to get g7 for our bishop. So the knight takes, and then we just finish like so. Oh, man. So at this point, she realizes she can't even get to the a pawn with the king. Okay, e3, bishop h5, holding that pawn. Yeah, fair enough. Honestly, one thing black could do here, it's not very stylish, Stan. We could go bishop g7, just threatening a2. There's nothing stylish about this, I'm afraid. And now this king just has to sit here. Since I left the pawn on a3, it can't attack anything. It just sits here defending these squares. And then we just bring our king. No style, but no counterplay either. It's a good way to put it. 
Yeah. So, yeah, white just can't do anything. And there might be better, because this knight is just sitting here trying to stop bishop g7. It can't do anything else. But our king is stuck inside right now, so we might need to do it to get out. I don't know if there's another win or not. But it's a sufficient one, I guess. So, yeah, the pawn went. Still playing. C5? Can't black just take that and the knight can't take because of queening? Is there a trick here? Huh? B takes C5 played. King D3. So the idea is to go king here and try and trade this pawn. After A1, knight takes, bishop takes. The bishop here, well, I'll just put the moves on the board. This bishop stops the knight from coming back to defend this pawn. So white's reducing the number of pawns on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Should still be enough to win, even with the wrong rook pawn and the bishop. But I understand the idea. Now you could never allow a knight for bishop trade, for example, pretty much. So you would have to have some care. So is there a move here? Lay is thinking, is there a move here? Because you don't need to play this to um to safeguard this pawn. Like you could move the knight now, right? You don't have like a ton of great squares you can move it to, but what about knight d5, for example? Then on king c4, knight e3 wins the game. And these pieces can't move because they're just frozen around this pawn. There's just no need to play the a pawn. So I think knight d5, um, that's a good move. You know, and your knight's got pretty good squares coming up. You're also threatening knight b4 uh, to push the king and, and bishop backwards. Um, yeah, so that'll be it. I think knight d5 will be played, and then it's really high time to resign. Knight b5 instead. There's a somewhat similar idea, king c4, knight a3. The move looks, yeah, it's just a matter of taste because she's going to play knight d4. Instead of from d5, we had like knight b4 and knight f4 kind of threats. Here, she wants to go knight d4, trade the knight, and then get a full queen. So th this is equally resignable to knight d5. Either one should be the last move of the game, I would say. Yeah, Gukesh obviously belongs in this tournament, and he played a normal tournament, which Gary was even invited to, I think. So, do I think Lay knows how to mate with Bishop and Knight if it comes down to it? Yes, I do, B Swizzle. I think you'll find very, very, very few players over 2,500 who can't checkmate with Bishop and Knight. Maybe none. Maybe none. Yep, and this was resignation right in this position. Right on. So both Chinese women win today. Tan Zhang Yi with a lot of style. A lot of style. Really flashy. But Lei wins a game with black, which is, you know, really, really huge as well. So big step for them. Um, they're competing with Goryachkina for the uh, for the lead in this tournament. I mean, Tan's starting to run away a little bit, but Goryachkina was in second going into today. So we'll see. If she can put up some defense here, it looks like, um, I mean, if she can keep the pace by winning, but it looks like Nergil won the G6 pawn recently. That's not really a good sign for black, but maybe it was on purpose because now the white pieces can't move at all. Maybe it was genius. We're going to have to back up a little bit and see it because if it was genius, well, we'd like to see it. This is the last point we saw this position was knight check, king here, f5. Notice she's putting every pawn on a light square. There's a certain um, logic or advice or whatever about putting pawns on the opposite color of the bishop so it can't fight, so it can't target your pawns, right? Here she's doing the opposite, but she's she's done it in a way where the bishop can't target any of the pawns. What she's doing is limiting the bishop. 
right? She's killing the bishop with this structure because the bishop can't get to g6 and it can't get to c6. So the d5 and f5 pawns are protected and they're blocking all this bishop's diagonals. So bishop here, knight f6, allowing rook g7. Oh, she clearly did this on purpose, I think. Gave the pawn to lock in this positional advantage. What else could she do here to get that knight back in the game? If she didn't want to go knight f6 to e4, she could have maybe just started pushing the c pawn here, right? Not only did 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 uh, Ali Reza get cooked, gone, gone, stand, but he uh, he boiled a pot of water and then jumped in and uh, Vidit added some salt to taste and did some stirring and stuff, but he did put in a lot of the work towards uh, serving himself up there. C5, rook check on the sixth rank, king f7. Okay, as soon as we do this, we start getting harassed. Uh, we could go this way or we could go this way, give up the pawn and push, but the bishop gets back in the game too fast. So here, 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 here. And the king can go hide. Although, there's this trick I learned where you do this, and even when the king's hiding, you get this bishop f5 threat. So that would force the knight here. Maybe this move. Black's not having an easy time of it, yeah. Yeah, not having an easy time. So I don't know if she had a really good alternative to what she did, but I kind of like this approach. That's my first instinct is to like it, even though it gives up this pawn. Um, so this piece, these pieces, right? I mean, so amazing, completely locked down. Rook h2, c5, bishop f1, maybe c4. Seems like the idea would be to queen the c-pawn now, that white's kind of passively tied to this. What's white trying to do? Is white trying to play bishop e2 and then be able to move the rook? For now, rook h6 check, it would just be king g7 and you'd have to just go straight back to f2 because rook f2 is checkmate. It's not just a pawn, it's not just the base of your structure. It's checkmate. Okay, Abdul says maybe bishop d3 is the plan. Well, good thing the move I wanted to play and that Goryachkina played is c4 and that stops bishop d3. Yeah, so bishop e2 to free the rook is the one option. Before black pushes c3, if they've got a lot of time here, they can play a move like rook d2 that stops bishop d3 and then gets out of the way of the pawn as well. So if white just sits here going rook g2, rook h2, then I think rook d2 and c3, etc., is a really simple winning plan. So I guess the question is bishop e2 and then getting the rook about it back into the game. Yeah, bishop e2 played, which I think I had said would be the one move to consider here. So if the rook moves, freeing the way for the c-pawn, white has rook h6 check and rook c6. That's white's defensive concept. Sorry, the arrows are not showing properly. Um, if black plays king g6 to try and control that square, you can always check and then come back. So something like this, rook check, king here, rook here, king d7. Patrick's concept, just take away all the squares from the rook, get it out of the way. Well, how does white fight here? 
How does white even fight? This pawn's going at least to c2, and white doesn't really have anything to do. Maybe here to go to c1? Like this? Looks like there's a winning plan for black here that's pretty simple. And it is knight to c3 to a2. Attacking the rook, taking control of c1. Nothing left to do, really. Plus, Patrick says this position might be Tsugtsvang, like white can't move anything. You can't even do this bishop d3 move, Abdul, because black ignores the bishop, right? This is a real, a real trap white's in. Man, this game of Tanjong Yi's, did everybody see this thing? This was outrageously brutal. e6. Finally opening up this bishop. Oh my lord. Oh my lord. So I mean one variation, and we didn't talk about any of the variations, but one variation is king here. And then maybe you lift your king so the rook can go to h1. Maybe you lift your rook. But it's the same idea. You're going here and here with checkmate. And if the king goes here, then you play knight c6 attacking the queen. She goes somewhere and you do this. And then it's just, you know, then you just deliver the checkmate from there. All right? Rook h3. So... So king h6, rook f3, it looks like the end, I think. So king h8 was played, and she played knight c6 anyway, and took the pawn on g5, threatening checkmate. So that's what knight c6 does. Uh, queen g7 had to be stopped, so rook g8 was played, and here there may be multiple winning moves. It's possible. And maybe even here, you know, white should have considered 97 or did consider 97 queen g5, just trying to break this square here. But here, here, rook f6. Hang on, let me just think something. Sorry, I when I see a queen sack, I have to calculate a second because it's too fun. Nah. This looks right here. So if here, and these pieces are in bad shape. Black's up a piece in the end game. Of course, they're going to lose it back, but is it lost then? Yeah, I guess it's lost. Rook f7 is better than this. I was afraid of d4. We have to calculate. Is this better than capturing Black's queen to do this? You'd have to be really delivering checkmate immediately. White took here, uh, black took on f6. I suppose d4 might also have been a move here. Anyway, this happened, this happened. Knight comes in, attacking that rook. Forcing it off the back rank. Nope, gives it up. The rook can't move, I guess, because it's stopping queen g7. 
mate trades hitting the queen knight takes g8 with knight f6 in case of knight takes queen and then this move here black's pieces aren't even off sides they're all in the game but the king's defending the queen bishop's covering h8 so she has to take take and you can't stop it good lord that was that was phenomenal what a beat down at the end there Rook h6 played. This game's still going. Um, okay, let's keep that game going. Let's just look. All right, the other game's done here. Oh, it's a bloody day. Every game decisive. So Lei beat Humpy, Tan beat Muzichuk, and Lano beat Vaishali. Fairly quickly. E4, E5 game. That's a nice move. Knights are landing on d3, f3 and g2 are attacked. Can't take it because of queen g5. Threatening knight h3 as well as the rook. So rook a2 is the only move to defend the rook and f2. And the knight just comes in to d3. Oh, some nice knight hops. Do you guys see that? Boom! Bishop can't take because of queen takes queen. Takes! Right, because white pins the knight, so to speak. Can't take the queen because you take the queen. No, it can. And hops onto these two. Brutal. And blacks up. A rook against the knights in an endgame with nothing to do. Oh, crunch. All right, I think I'm going to get to bed and call this one as a win for black. Sally Mova's got a minute on the clock. King d6 has been played by Goryachkina. Taking some squares. White's maybe going to give a check. A check. A check and get back here. That queen king shouldn't go to b5. Anyway, the king should go somewhere, and the pawn should push. Uh, it's just time to go to bed, one way or another. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Goryachkina probably deserves better, but uh, you have to remember that not only. Am I streaming till 1, 2, or yesterday, 3 a.m.? But then after I stop the stream, I have a baby here in the house who screams and cries all night. So. Uh, hasta mañana. Tomorrow's round seven. It'll be the halfway point. Um, I guess the, the standings are probably shaking up a bit on the on the women's side, but Tan, since she won, will still be out ahead of the field. By a full point ahead of Lano and Goryachkina after they win. Yeah. Um, and there's a big matchup tomorrow, right, which is Naka versus Nepo. Big one. So, yeah. So we'll see, we'll see you guys tomorrow for that. And uh, yeah, take care and be well, everybody.
Yep. <laughs> Take care, everybody.